All right, so now we're going to go for a long pose, and we're going to work in uh, additive, subtractive uh, charcoal. So toning down now a piece of drawing paper with a, a compressed charcoal stick, and then I'll take the chamois and uh, the chamois and chamois. Uh, and begin to blend that into the paper and make it a nicer, cleaner uh, tone to that. Um, and there are many different ways to resolve this issue. That could be looser, it could be even smoother. So, um, you know, one thing to remember for this long-term drawing, and really all of these four or five that I'll do that they're drawing, so I'm not doing um, photo real, you know, drawings with graphite, trying to make it look exactly like the the uh, photograph they're drawing. So it's, so it's more aligned to traditional Renaissance or Baroque, you know, type traditional drawing, figure drawing in, in, in that sense, more like an academy kind of kind of uh, drawing for sure than it would be to do photo real kind of stuff. That might take, you know, 50 hours to, to do every little inch. And there are mistakes along the way that happen that draftsmen live with. I think um, that is probably one of the the new things I think you should learn at the later stages is to live with some uh, slight changes because I'll be honest with you if with you're working from the live model which I like to do and I, I generally don't like to do drawings more than about an hour hour and a half from the model because they move and that's totally natural I've never been with the model that I'm working from that hasn't moved uh, they're breathing and their their heart is beating. So um, with imagery and then setting up a camera, be quite honest, it sometimes uh, it's because the the image I'm working from is always generally from a laptop, relatively close by, um, and my angles flat, which I I don't like either. I'm not making any excuses. I make more mistakes and I live with them. I make mistakes when I draw from the live model. Learn to live with little changes. Now, I'm going to make two errors here um, that are going to be in the gesture part. I need to lean the head over further. Can you see that? The rib cage is not quite tilted. But when we get to the end of the drawing and the image is away, it doesn't erode the quality of the drawing or the expression. So it's a an error I live with. What I do want to show you is the legs I put together uh, a little closer and I knew it going going in quite quite early on, probably within 30 minutes and I, I didn't want to change it. I, I generally don't like to change minor errors because they're not to me not important unless there's really something specific why. And so, but however, in this video, this long-term pose, I'm going to show you that correcting an error, even late in the process, especially with charcoal, additive subtractive charcoal, is really no big deal at all. You can change it quite easily. I just didn't want to, it's already a long enough video, I didn't want to make it even longer with more of a head change, but I could have pushed the, the rib cage over. So, and you see already that the head's a little large. I'll, I'll, I'll um, tighten that up a little bit, but I will reduce the deltoid size or the shoulder size a little bit later. So I think that this is a good instructional video, not only for a long-term additive subtractive on white paper with, with a compressed charcoal tone, and I'm using charcoal pencil throughout. It's also important to see how in, in one way that you can correct uh, these errors that you make, even if it, they're quite, quite late in the process. Because when we, again, when we use the chamois, that just tones everything back to that, that uh, middle, middle gray tone. So that works pretty, pretty well for us. So just keep that in mind. Um, and don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to live with some that are minor errors. Um, you know, those of you, I've gotten some criticism on, on YouTube uh, just a few times. I think it's kind of interesting um, from, from students like, well, that, that arm is not quite thick or long enough, uh, or he's not quite leaning over. The, the drawing technique is, is pretty right on, and so I live with some of those ma minor errors. If it's major, you know, if I'm drawing... The head four size is too big. You're gonna you're gonna want to change that. But but generally, 
Um, it's probably, I don't think I've ever made a drawing where there wasn't little changes to what I was actually working from, whether it's still life or figure, whatever it is observationally. And you learn that you're, you're making a drawing and you're interpreting, you're not making a copy. Otherwise, you would take this image, you would trace it, and you would measure it, and you would get everything as exact as you can, and that would be anathema to what I'm teaching right now. Now, there's certain processes in contemporary art, you, you know, photographic work, uh, for whatever purpose, you, you might actually need that, but that's not what this is about. It's just essentially drawing uh, techniques that are shown and then can be practiced over and over, and then when you master them, you can you can do all kinds of sorts of things and idiosyncratic conceptual you know kinds of things too uh, as well maybe via via Selman's work if you don't know her work as a as an artist she's photo she does these photographic renderings of oh lots of things rocks and spatial celestial uh, uh, stars and sand and water etc and so on and they're and they're very photographic I would want to spend a hundred hours doing that. And another artist to look at you might really like is for photographic kind of look um, is Armin Meerman, A R M I N, Meerman M, I believe M E E R M A N. And uh, he's a, a, a friend of mine, local artist, Cincinnati, Ohio ish, uh, Michigan. Uh, artist who's got a wonderful career as well, but he does more tightly rendered graphite drawings. So that's a whole nother technical kind of thing. So as we're starting in, I'm working obviously with gesture and lay-in and working in solidifying the drawing, thinking through the volumes and solids, but drawing what I see as I project volumes in my mind. And you can already tell, Look, take a look at the, the rib cage and then, especially the shoulder region, see how I could push that over a little bit, and the head could go over further, so I don't lean the head over as much. I live with it. It's it's not a it's not a big big deal. Um, matter of fact, I could take this pose and put the head in in many different positions and make it work really pretty well. So um, don't sweat it. Don't sweat it if you if you're making small little changes that are not proportional change uh, uh, proportional uh, proportionally off that's a better way of saying it learn to live with it and I think you'll be you'll you'll be much happier with with your with your kind of your drawing let it happen more intuitively and naturally through action gesture and, and volume so that'll be interesting to see what you think about as we go deeper into into this process so sit back we've got a long a long run. It's a deep, deep run of a long pose. It's about three, almost, almost four hours. So you might want to watch this in shifts. But you know, I, I get lots of positive feedback for these longer poses. You know, a lot, a lot of, you know, people on YouTube. And I'm not a. I wouldn't call myself a YouTuber. I'm, I'm a professional artist and a professor of drawing and painting at uh, Northern Kentucky University. So there's the plug. But rather, you know, I, I get paid to teach. That's my day job. My night job is being an, an artist and, and showing my work across the country. And so they work nicely together. But I get paid to teach. I get paid to demo. And I get paid to show students how it's done um, in a generic kind of uh, traditional way. These are diagrammatic in some sense. They're not they're not my my personal work, but it shows it shows students where to start, how to how to manage all this material and time and difficulty, and then they can take it and make make a lot from it, you know, as they want, you know, on their own. So that's that's important. So, um, point being here is that the long poses and all the narration is important to see what I'm thinking, what kind of marks I'm making, how I change to get a deep, deeper understanding of, of making a drawing. What I really loved about my undergraduate education, I went to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Look that up sometime if you're interested. It's a um, wonderful, it's kind of a, it's a modern, modernist building in, in uh, uh, the hills of Pasadena, the Royal Seco there by the Rose Bell. 
Uh, so if you're if you want to get that you know correct, they have a great website. But what was important about our instruction is our classes were eight hours long, which sounds like a long time. They went by fast, um, and we well, always we took breaks for lunch and and, and uh, rest breaks. But we were able to have our professors draw along with us or paint along with us because the class was eight hours. They would lecture and demo some, and then sometimes they would just work with us. And it was wonderful to work alongside them and then have them critique your work. Um, it was invaluable. So uh, we do it a little bit differently in, in a public university where there are three-hour classes twice a week, so I don't have the time to do the demo uh, or the or the working with the students so I do demos but the videos now suffice for that point being it's great to see demos in action especially long-term ones that we you just don't get unless you're around artists so I'm hoping that a lot of you if you spend the time here I'm hoping you get you know quite a bit out of the the pose and if you do let me know give me a give me an email and say you know what you think about about you know having the long term long term poses so I see a lot of these how to videos on YouTube and, and they're fine for an, in in a general kind of sense and many of them are quite quite good actually but they're very quick or they're really sped up and you don't get the 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 finish of it many of them are just excellent so you can already see where the legs are going to come together pretty close or closer together, the negative space between the legs are going to be a little close. So that's going to be another area. I could have lived with it. I'm going to correct it way at the end. I thought, you know, I, I would just explain it away and leave it like I did earlier, but I thought, you know, just let me correct it and show you guys um, that it's really no big deal to make make those those changes. And I left one to show you really both examples of what I'm thinking in my mind is, okay, I'm going to stand the figure up a little bit taller, not because I generally wanted to. I just did, um, and that's okay. And I lived with that, but then I, I wanted to, to widen up the legs and actually thin out the leg that's, that's uh, bent that he's putting more, more pressure on as he's leaning, leaning over to as well, so... All right, so hopefully you got the spiel on the long-term poses, how they're important to see. I get that they're long. And now we have, you know, blocking in, laying in, excuse me, laying in the figure linearly. So I'm shorthanding the volumes in the solids. I'm thinking about them as I'm drawing what I see, but also utilizing what I know about a cube, a sphere, and a cylinder and modified egg forms to make the figure work or work out for me in in this sense. So it's putting all of our our drawing techniques together now in in these longer term poses. And that's really how a semester goes in in my figure drawing classes. We isolate all the different techniques during the semester starting with gesture and working through volume and working through the lima bean and so on and so forth and then we ultimately get to several weeks where we get these longer poses to put it to put it all together and make it and and, and make it work for us and get to see it happily all together light value edges and contrasts and so you get the idea of, of this coming yeah, t coming together in a way that's that is um hopefully powerful to the student and it lets you know where you're at what you're deficient on what you can work on and how you can make uh, changes to your drawing over time and that's important because you're going to make consistent errors over time um, like making the head too big or making the the hands and feet too small I make my hands and feet in my drawings a little larger you'll notice the hand 
of the model, the one with the fingers exposed and light, a little, you'll notice it's it's bigger. It's it's probably it's bigger than it needs to be, but I make it that way because the eye needs to, for whatever reason, scientifically I don't know, we we generally hands that are at size or a little smaller tend to look too small. So it's kind of an optical thing that I've noticed. I've never really researched it or even wrote about it. But you see it in the work of, of certain artists, Rubens, but you see it in contemporary figurative artists. Uh, and one of my favorites is Lucian Freud, British artist who's recently died, unfortunately, but figurative artist. And the he uses radical scale changes and feet sometimes in hands, and it, it really, it's pretty powerful. So, you know, use the chamois to erase. You can tell where I'm like, okay, that's a little thick there. Let me thin that out. And I can do a lay-in, a little bit of value block-in with core shadow before we even get to the light, separation of light and dark value. So proportion of hands uh, can work out well for you if you extend them a little larger, about a size or, or so excuse me, larger than you think you need, and generally it works out well. Most I notice most of most of our beginning students with the figure um, are a little they draw them a little small. We make the we make the joke that they're T Rex hands, Tyrannosaurus Rex hands. They're pretty pretty tiny. Um, and so we, we make jokes about that, that they need to go obviously bigger. So working down the model. Another thing, I, I lean that leg a little bit. We'll straighten that leg out a little bit later too as well. So all these things can be considered as changes. You know, another thing about working additive subtractively with tone paper is the wonderful quality of change that you can make with a drawing. And it's like a piece of clay almost. It can, it can, it always kind of stays wet for you. One of, one of my favorite artists that works in drawing and probably maybe the biggest name in the world in drawing is William Kentridge so if you don't know who he is you might want to look him up and um, it, it's spelled just like it sounds William and last name Kent Kentridge K-E-N-T-R-I-D-G-E -E. he makes work that is or has been generally about his experience in South Africa with apartheid uh, uh, he's a Caucasian artist and um, has made work about the division of the races, racism, apartheid in South Africa. And what's unique about his technique is they're fairly raw, I wouldn't say crude, they're very sophisticated, but raw additive subtractive drawings on, on paper, like three feet or four feet, and he makes animated drawings from them using an old camera and a stop lens that he holds in his hand makes like an animated drawing he makes a few marks makes a photograph and he and over time um, makes a a intuitive movie based off of erasing and drawing and and then of course the characters evolve etc what's I think really brilliant about the technique is that he uses one piece of generally one or two pieces of paper um, to make uh, a work move, meaning that if we wanted this figure to get up and stand up, stretch, and then walk out of the camera, we would only use this piece of paper. Can you imagine how many drawings you would use on the, this piece of paper? Well, because it's additive subtractive, because it's pliable, it's changeable, it's, it's, uh, you can, you can wipe, wipe it away with the chamois, it makes it very malleable. So it's a technique that, quite frankly, I would almost use all the time when I use charcoal, um, depending on the, the look I want. And, and I teach quite a bit and add it's attractive just, be, just because it's so, so movable. I would say this, as you're learning to draw and you're young in drawing and young in art, charcoal can be really difficult to handle, to control. I get it. I didn't like working in charcoal when I was a student in the beginning because we jumped right in with charcoal on white paper and it was hard to control so I understand that so again that's why I like to and I've shown through other videos with the figure using color pencil or a progresso type pencil 
that has a full shaft of tone that can be sharpened like a charcoal pencil but is is wax and is not as blendable or as smudgeable so if you're you know again if you're having trouble you might want to use one of those use a black or a brown or a sanguine and they look like master study you know technique drawings but the only thing is there you have to push down a lot harder to work with them so uh, charcoal ultimately is is so versatile with drawing material that quite frankly it just it just supersedes most other materials but uh, then again you know people's personality come into play and and you use what you what you most want to communicate with. So, you know, blocking in now the shadow pattern of the model as I'm working through. You can see I've got my gesture, so I don't have to rethink. Even though it's a little bit raised higher, it works. Um, and so as I'm delineating the figure further, I don't have to think about composition and where the figure is going. One of the pet peeves I have with some students is they forget about using gesture. The first three minutes they compose, they, they are starting to draw and they have a torso and a head. They don't have anything else, no, no uh, dynamic or breathing armature. And the problem there is they, they don't necessarily know where to go later on. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a more of a difficult problem. So lay in your complete gesture. Give yourself the ability to um, have that laid down so you can add it in later. And quite frankly, the model might move or you might take a break or the model might leave and you want to finish a drawing and, and uh, remember the pose. So the, the, the aspect of gesture is ter terribly important. So delineating more of the, the, the upper leg here, the the uh, pelvic region, pelvic crest, tensor fascia latte. <coughs> this is what I call the Starbucks muscle. And then we come down to the quads here, rectus femoris. And so take a look at the air I make with the legs too. See, look at the negative space between each knee. And there's, there's much more of a narrow gap between the legs. So um, I would live with this pose. Doesn't bother me, it's just a different kind of pose. Um, however, I'm going to change it for for your sake is uh, and for the video and for the instructional sake, I guess for instruction sake, right? Just to show you later how I mean deeply later how you can you can change this over. So working with the neck and then the deltoid here, the shoulder, feeling a little bit of that bone and muscle, that medial or excuse me, a lateral part of the deltoid, a little bit of the, of the rib cage emerging in the back medial head of the tricep. And coming down with the volume and gesture of the arm. Laying in the volume of that arm, coming through and over. <clears throat> There's so much to be thankful for, I think, with charcoal. It's so versatile that and it gets rich, velvety darks that can be blendable. It's very painterly, but it is... It is the material that I introduced last in my courses because of its its difficulty, but it's also one once we introduce it, we generally stay with it, you know, quite 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 lengthy time. And so you'll see me sketch in the hand now. I'm going to leave these hands a little larger than what we what we see. What we wind up with will be a, a much much larger or slightly larger hand than what we have with the image of the model. And again, these, these models of reference images come from Croquis Cafe. You can see it in the corner there. They're a wonderful organization, I believe out of Chicago. So if you get a chance, take a look at their website, Croquis Cafe. They're on Vimeo, and they're, they've got a website. If you just Google it in, you'll find it. And if you can, please donate something to their cause. Uh, and so they produce quite a bit of reference material um, and have done so uh, quite often now with wonderful different variations of model poses so 
laying in now the outer uh, arm and hand. Sometimes it's more about just the shape. And you can see I make a couple efforts and don't like what I have and just take it away. Sometimes you're like, yeah, I don't like that, I don't like that. You look at it and you're like, yeah, maybe I'll change it. So don't worry about it. Take your chamois and just boop, another correction, how easy that is. And it's like kind of reevaluate. It's more like a silhouette. So I'll come back to it in a moment. Neck. Head. It's probably at this I'm sure already I realized, well, that head's probably could lean over, but it's no it's just no big deal. And if it is, I'd change it. Just kind of feeling in the shadow pattern of where the eye is. It's like he has a mask on. There's no need to draw in the all the structure of the eye. The block in, in the light and dark block in can be your structure for you. So you're keeping all your knowledge of volumetric structure in your mind as you're blocking shadow shape. If you're drawing tonally, if you're not, sometimes you want to draw the structure in because it's not a tonal drawing. It might be diagrammatic or it might be some style that you're exploring that, that uh, you want to do that. So forearm now, the flexors and extensors together, the forearm, getting the, just, just the silhouette uh, of, the, of the arm coming out. Excuse me. Feeling the deltoid, the shoulder region, the lateral head here on the outside. Three different heads, the lateral, the anterior, and the posterior parts of the deltoid. Three different parts of that muscle. Or, or easier way to say front side and back easier too as well. So you see sometimes I move my finger across, sometimes I'll blend an edge or I'll smooth it out or I'll, I'll kind of erase with my finger. You'll see that a lot too as well. So you know later on as we go through this particular te technique I use, I, I'm more of a kind of a, a tonal and then a hatched kind of guy in terms of these academic studies I like to do, but you can blend with a stump. You'll see me use that a bit or a paper towel for tone, for smoothing and blending, or you can use the chamois. The chamois I find it's more it's better for an eraser and a tone initiator rather than uh, a blending kind of tool, but you can use your fingers. Uh, I would say just be careful, don't over blend without knowing more about art history and, and aesthetics through through art history and drawings from the Renaissance and Baroque and, and in romanticism and so on so you get a feeling for how artists use not only tone but also line in hatched line in contour line to make drawings three-dimensional but not photographic so you know photography you know we're using photographic imagery often but you know I was trained from the live model uh, Renaissance artists Baroque artists were trained from the live model but before that they were trained from Renaissance master drawings. They did tracings. They did value studies and mastered the master's you know uh, technique and aesthetic and style. And then eventually they took off on their own. But then they worked from the live model. But um, it, it is good to get in front of the live model as much as you can and also practice these techniques. So you can see where the hand is a little bigger than what has been given to me. I like that look a little bit larger. You may not that way, but it, it really doesn't uh, make it look smaller. You, you don't, you don't want to wind up with a smaller hand or foot. So I'm going to make some changes now to the little structure he's uh, leaning on, standing on. It's a nice, nice build with the folding, etc. With the cloth. Now we'll come back up here, delineate a little bit further in the in the ear area, and start blocking, laying in the line. Excuse me, line work, line delineation of the of the shadow shapes. Because we're getting, you know, we'll get close here to the to a block in. And of course, since we're working in additive, subtractive. 
<clears throat> the easiest way, again, the quickest way and simplest way and most efficient way will be to block in with, with the light. Once you get your shadow patterns, then you want to take that, that eraser, whichever eraser you want to use. I prefer a kneaded eraser here for soft, blendable edges and then start, start lifting out the light of the, the model. In this case, it's top lit, mostly slightly from the left. So now, most artists, if you make some errors here, this would be a good time to change. This would be a good time, for instance, to change. If it was really important, change the shoulder, pull it down a little bit, lean the head over, lean the torso, and then uh, uh, flatten the left leg and then the right leg. Also, spread them apart a little bit too uh, as well. But I don't. I don't really find it to be an awful uh, uh, change in what I've, I've seen because the proportions are accurate. So now I'm going to block in. So now you see me pick up the kneaded eraser and notice how dark and dirty it is. When you buy those, those gummied kneaded erasers, they're pretty clean. They won't stay clean long. You can clean them by pulling them apart. You probably know that already. Um, and you'll find that the dirtier they are, or less clean they are, the uh, less material they'll pick up. That can be beneficial for, you know, tonal blocking if you don't want to go too light, too, too quick. So that's another technique to keep in mind. So I like to keep mine a little uh, dirty, meaning that they don't, they have a little bit of uh, charcoal material in them. Also, if you're working in different materials, um, keep your kneaded erasers generally f uh, for graphite only or charcoal only. If you mix those two, it, it tends to erode the quality since they don't mix as well. So now what I've picked up there is a Japanese mono eraser. It is a, you notice it's kind of like a pen and it has erasable fill, uh, tips in it. And they're wonderful because it's a very firm eraser and then you can erase back more uh, individually, specifically, if you will. Uh, into tight, small areas, and they come in different thicknesses. Some are, uh, you know, three, uh, not three quarters, but maybe a quarter of an inch thick, and some are eighth and down to sixteenth, and so you can go really, really small with, with small, smaller with the detail that uh, you, know, you want. So I come back with the kneaded eraser now to begin to now the big, nice mop in of erasing the light out. And I try to be mindful of the contouring of the forms as if I'm on that surface, I'm moving my hand around his deltoid, touching it, you know, massaging, whatever, however you want to you think of it. Don't think of it weird, but just think of it as a contouring around. And so your stroking pattern really matters, how you move across the uh, forms of the artist, excuse me, the model that you're drawing. Maybe he's an artist too, I don't know, but as you're moving across his, the forms of the model, give, give very strong consideration to the direction. If not, it'll look stiff, it'll flatten out your image. Everything you want to be doing, you want to be keeping a rhythm and a dynamic quality, excuse me, to, to your drawing. And so even though I raise him up a little bit and keep his legs a little closed, the, the quality of the movement is, is still there, so it's not really bothersome. So you can see where the block in starts to emerge as we have our model beginning to illuminate onto the surface of the paper. And that's what we're looking for, good here, good illumination of the model. Meaning that we're getting that separation, working, getting that good separation of light, light side and dark side. Where's the light side and where's the dark side? And that's what we found out with our linear lay in. And now we stay within that general light, dark shadow pattern and just lift out. Take it off. Don't take off too much. Ease into it. That's again why I, I highly suggest to, to keep that. Uh, eraser dirty, meaning that um, once you use it for a little while it's going to get clogged 
and they're just obviously there are times where it gets too clogged and you have to kind of pull it apart and clean it but it it just gradually takes it out I can go I can take out a lot more but I don't want to he's not in absolute light uh, he is the only thing absolute light on that image is the actually logo the branding type down below it's pretty light right everything else is bathed in light in shadow but the light is soft and not particularly too too harsh So now I'm going to take my mono eraser and grab that little fold of his abdomen there. A little, a little fat through there in the fold of the skin. I find that the thinner the models are, that area gets more folded. There was a time when um, that area of my physique folded. Uh, it doesn't happen as often now, but you get maybe that happens to some of you too but the thinner generally there's just a a less uh, heavier fat there for for lack of a better word that is harder to grab and then when you're thin there's just it this seems to be fat you can grab onto a little bit and it gives you a little bit more of a tuck in a roll there all right so now working on the leg so don't get used to this leg too much it'll disappear towards the end of the drawing and then it'll reemerge into a, a, a little bit different positioned leg and so now just following the shadow pattern we see that cast shadow on the the pubic region from the torso and then on the top of the leg on the on the uh, uh, thigh muscle rectus femoris muscle there I'm just just gently taking off enough of what I see that's a complex area where we have a cast shadow we also have a form shadow underneath the thigh there on the uh, hamstring muscles and then we have form shadow here on the knee when we're getting close to the end of the top of the condyle on the medial side of the uh, tibia here and uh, so uh, we see that and then on the calf area down the leg we gently start to take off take off the light here and work down into that bone area where it's where it's uh, harder and thicker down to the condyle of the the medial condyle of the leg there of the tibia and so there's not not too much more to block in there's a little bit left we could come down and grab that patella region or you could leave it could have left it for later but I'll I'll block in a little bit more now so that you can see how you know with that Japanese mono and I'm going to use two for this this drawing this is the thicker one or the more uh, the wider one actually and then you'll see me later on use use it um, in the more thinner one for really specific areas like some of the eye or the nose or the, the face and really noodling in detail but we're we're pretty far away from that right now we need we need lots of just general uh, uh, drawing technical uh, lay-in, block-in, and core shadow, and then fine-tuning for a long, long time to get to get there. So we're we're quite a bit of, of steps away, but this is a good kind of you know intermediate you know process here. This is about 30 or so minutes, and almost 40. And this is probably what you know in art school we did a lot of. We did about 40, 35, 40 minute poses a lot. Got to this stage, and then we. We moved it on to maybe an hour, and um, every now and then we do two, three, four hours, but then or we go to an eight-hour pose, something like that. So three or four is kind of in the middle, but you can get a nice finished rendering in. But we did a lot of sketches that were about at this finished level, um, maybe a little bit with the core shadow in. And I'd go faster if they don't have to narrate or talk or slow it down. But this is this kind of stage is good for a lot of practice. And we'll just take that, whoop, take that too bright of a spot back. With a little light on the hand. Grabbing the back of the thumb, the arching over, the space, negative space in between the hand, the fingers, and the thenar part of the palm of the thumb side, the fat part, muscly part, and the hypothenar of the of the pinky side, or just that's that where I'm uh, erasing at now.
just to get the gesture, the kind of value and block in gesture of that too. So getting that clothy area. So we can give that a little expression for now. It's not the most, uh, excuse me, not the most important area. I mean, you could do a finish of that too. That'd give you your cloth study if you want. I'll probably do some some videos on, or certainly will actually on on cloth and in robes and folds. But the key to here is to block them into just g rhythm and movement gesture, scale and proportion, and separating light and dark with a little bit of edge edge uh, control. And I don't go into a lot of detail here because it's not important for this particular study. So not too much left and before we get we start to get on our way to to a coarse shadow and edges and starting to let it begin to come all together. So working the background. If you want to keep what you have with the image is fine too. And then you can can work accordingly. It's almost it's almost in really two strong divisions from the figure to the top is darker, not completely dark, not even close to completely dark. And then from the the pubic region downward and outward to the right is a little bit more in light, but not not heavily so. Kind of a light grayish wall. And I'll go back and correct that, that outer arm a little bit later on too as well. You can learn to live with, you know, little changes that you want to make or an error that you want to go back, excuse me, correct a little later. You're like, well, I'm not quite happy, but I'll, I'll move on for now. So I'm just now taking my kneaded eraser and using it uh, a little further to erase out the tone and separate the light from the dark not only in the model but also in the background and also the, the still life or the platform prop in through there and everywhere I suppose and through the legs into the pubic region with the genitals I don't really no need to go into any kind of anatomical lecture I think on on any of that, you can if you want. They're pretty simple. Basically, a cylinder and an egg in two egg forms. <laughs> I think you've got it. Same with well, with the um, the female. The breast forms are more obviously protruding more egg forms. So we get to the back of the leg here. And that gives it a full, you know, block in of okay. We kind of see everything: foreground, middle ground. In background, I see what I want, I like, what I don't like, and what I want to change, and 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 leave, and then I can build on uh, quite a bit with core shadow. All right, so now on to really uh, hitting uh, core shadow, and kind of my favorite part of a drawing uh, is to begin to really uh, give it give it the true light and value and volume. Uh, so now we'll go on to the the core shadow stage. So stage, and so you know, looking at the, the drawing is the light source is again from the top uh, of the model, slightly left and uh, relatively to the to the side, um, <clears throat> but certainly high and, and slightly to the left. And so now we can come come through and get a little tighter and start to analyze uh, some of these some of these salient and relevant changes that are going to now naturally occur and, and start to analyze edges. So now as we're putting it all together we can go a little bit more complex with tightening up the drawing, taking the drawing to the next stage of development and adding adding obviously detail top of the hair and through here and then also core shadow and cast shadow, the sockets of the eyes, uh, and so on. And then uh, as we go a little bit deeper in the drawing, I'll take you through uh, a little cl more close-ups of camera angles so we can get deeper into 
do that process. So now I'm adding coarse shadow where the light ends or terminates and the shadow begins. And so that's going to get that wonderful, soft, blurry, banded uh, coarse shadow uh, that's turning the model's head. And everything is, on the other side, generally done for us. Uh, if you left it in a very uh, kind of unrefined sketch phase, which would be uh, mostly reflected light back in through there. Now we've got the socket area of the eye with brow. And so, again, we are going through a general you know, uh, pass to get more specificity with the drawing. Uh, and so it will still look closer to a finish, but not necessarily quite so. And then again, you know, how, how close do you want to get to a finish of such a small head? It could be uh, very generalized and still get a very specific type to his head. So notice we're getting structure already just with light and shape, and now we're working tone value. So we're getting very complex. We're working shape, volume, we're working value and edges, and also um, for, for many of you, what you kind of know about anatomy and then what, what we can add to that conversation. But we can already get more of a three-dimensional quality to the, the aspect of the drawing. So the eye sockets become kind of a mask. and It's very, very much based on skull structure, getting around the cheek here to the sideburn and side of the head. <clears throat> You're constantly looking, and then you're analyzing, and then you're drawing. A little bit of background tone now in through there as well. I always like to add that quickly to the drawing study till I can relate what I've got going on on all areas of the drawing. It's like you know, working holistically all over and not just one piecemeal, or what I like to call a jigsaw puzzle approach, but rather a holistic wholeness to the aspect. That, that works most of the time in traditional drawing, but uh, contemporary approaches can be rule breakers, which I think is fun and uh, fun too. So now coarse shadow. Darkest part of the shadow is that deltoids turning. And that deltoid is a little bulgy and high, and I'm going to correct it later on in the drawing. <clears throat> Neck in through, working that background tone. Notice how I'm changing the tip of my pencil sometimes from a, a very fat broad range to that tiny to a very tiny uh, uh, tip as well. So you'll see me move the pencil uh, around uh, quite a bit in, in, in the drawing. And of course, you'll see me pick up different tools. You'll see me pick up the, the charcoal pencils, which I'm using hards, excuse me, mediums and soft and extra soft. I generally don't use the hard. It's too hard. And I'll pick up the, the compressed charcoal stick. And I've got a blunt one that I'll use for just the toning of the paper. And then I've got one that's chiseled for more fine or, or broad drawing. And the bigger the drawing, the more I use it. And so I'm just get chiseling in now, noodling in some of the structure, keeping it general. You know, I'm keeping the value pattern, which is fairly simple in this smaller head, you know, from this distance. That's something that's also interesting about using images is that you can you can you can blow them up and, and go deeper. Whereas if you're sitting in a class or if you're sitting with your own model privately or however you're working it is it you ultimately you're not going to go up to the models uh, a nude model's head and get in, you know, micro close. So unless you know them, I would assume really well. But you get the idea. So there's a difference in what we have now versus what you know perceptually artists in from the 16th, 15th, 16th century onward, and that, that's that's changed. Our drawings look differently too because of that uh, as well. So differences in strategy and style and aesthetics play a part in that as well as technology, photography, etc. and so on. And again, you know, I, I, I promote working from the live model, working from master studies first. If you can get, uh, if you can, you know, work that. I think, again, these, obviously we're using reference photos, so I can't, I can't say not to, but I, I am a big component of you, letting these be instructional and working, following along, and then getting to a point where you are going to get to the live model and also art historical reference when you're working on technique. And then when you're making art, you can do exactly whatever it is that you want and feel and think and do, and, and that's, that's, that's different.
this is a more academic and learning approach. <clears throat> So now, you know, I come back with a mono eraser. This is a smaller, a eighth of an inch tip to that. And uh, that just comes in there so I can tighten up in some of the eye area, the light area as well, and, and work those shapes. Nothing too definitive yet. You'll, you'll see me get quite a bit tighter and more refined. This drawing will look a lot better um, as, you, as you go through. Just getting a little bit cleaner with that as I'm working down through the core shed. Notice I'm taking more of my time since it's a longer pose and we can be more delicate with the strategy and quite frankly just all of the all the parts of that. <clears throat> so again that head could have been tilted over, leaning over further. But there was no need to change it. It really just makes it a slightly different position than what it's what it's at. You know, it's again, it's it's as if if you're off structurally. If I make his his head three times too large, or the the leg way too small, the foot you know four times too big, then you want to make changes. But if you're just moving the same proportional thing, if if that's if that's if you're okay with that, you, then certainly by all means. So keep that keep that in your mind as you look at works and judge other works, and that's part of. I think part of the issue with working from photographs is, quite frankly, the model never moves. That can be good at times. Um, the model will move on you, and you you have what you had at that particular time. <clears throat> so now adding more of the core shadow coming through on the shadow side. To add the core shadow on the nose, you can see I'm really getting try to get a read of it before I get comfortable, and then I'm looking for that eye socket in the shadow side. I'm not looking for detail and I'm looking for its structure and so I can put a shadow a hollow already in the shadow because the eye is buried through there. I don't want to see a lot of detail in through there. The detail will be on the lighter side of the model. So what we want to see is certainly more in the way of shadow <clears throat> only to get that greatly simplified. <clears throat> getting the neck in there, tonal, little tonal throw down in the back that can change, that can change value, that can change the, the atmospheric quality. We can smooth that, blend that down, but we want to get the light shadow blocked in on the head so we and down the body so we can get a better read of what we see in more detail and in the detail too uh, as well. I think that is also... In, you know, important to point out is that being able to see all the parts more together. That's that's especially if you're you're young at drawing or or, or young at heart at drawing. Or real, what I should say is early at drawing is that you want to be able to start to see that, and that's a very much a Renaissance a kind of technique. And then later on, you can change and go to rule breaking strategies, uh, contemporary drawing, which breaks all the rules. Of, of traditional drawing in exciting fresh ways but you want to be able to know what those those rules are suppose and I think that's what we're doing here at the drawing database is giving those it's pretty much a very very basic kind of tr drawing training and quite frankly to get to you know I have an advanced technique section but it's not very full right now because quite frankly there's so much more to learn at these intermediate and beginning levels and advanced stuff gets so so independent and subjective and idiosyncratic that it makes it more difficult but uh, so one on one or university type training is probably even better for that but i might try to fill up those sections later so so you can tell i'm getting a little bit more concrete and resolute with the head and the nose and the neck in the back side of the head in shadow. And that will still have a long way to go. They'll get to a point where I'll get a part of the way through and, and, and feel like, well, okay, that's concrete enough for a while. And so I can move down the body and can be more uh, resolute with the entire body. And then you take another wave with it starting at the head. You know, I also you teach my students to start from the head, work work from the head downward almost always in, in many drawings so that you do it all top to bottom. And then generally what happens too 
is that works out to make the head always more a little bit more finished than everything else so it becomes the focal point if you have to stop or in our case since we have time drawings just just so we can get enough poses in the semester it will always make the head the focal point so if I had to stop in five minutes of this sketch people would know okay that's a that's a figure sketch it's not certainly not finish finish but there's some resolution in the head which makes it the focal point which gives it a, a certain amount of, of finish that's something that you can keep in mind for yourself is to is to again always I like to say it's like a treadmill you go in different waves so you start over and it goes over and over and over you start from the head work your way down start from back again on the head work your way down and get tighter and tighter until you can get as tight as you want you can go photo reel if if you want and get super slick with it that's really not my game or I don't find that very interesting I can do that but but in it, in it it's a different kind of drawing approach and that would take you know this this might take this drawing 30 or 40 hours which I, I don't think anybody wants to watch a 30 40 hour video of one drawing I know I don't want to do one so now you can see where it's starting to get you know come together a little further in a more general sense so I'm just blocking in the edge or getting the edge cleaned up around the ear there Let's see if I can jump in a little tighter. Yeah, we pulled in a little tighter there. You can see a little bit closer. And you can see some of that nice hatching marks that you start to get with the not only the mono eraser, it's a pretty, pretty firm eraser, and then you can see the head start to emerge as a, a softer, more uh, nuanced object as well. So you can see me, you know, holding the charcoal pencil, kind of glazing over the tonality there. And I just want to tweak the socket, bring out the socket structure, that circular structure, a little bit uh, further. Now, I mean, this this J, the JPEG of the reference is pretty pretty high res, and so you could you could pop in on that head and get a very strong head start. But remember, we're doing a drawing at a distance that is relative to what the, in this case, the camera person was was uh, taking the, uh, the shot at. So if we become too hyper real in the head, then we have to be careful everything else has to become hyper real. So it, real. So it has to be focused enough all over so that the entire drawing makes sense for the distance from which you're drawing it. That, you know, don't think too hard about that. I know that sounds pretty pretty heavy. It, it, you can get, when you work digitally, those of you that, that have worked on a Wacom tablet or Wacom tablet, you, you, know, you can go into pixels so, so minutely at 240 or 300 that you can work a drawing that's meant to be at a distance in certain areas so tight that it, it when, when resolved outward a little bit, after you plunge in and you come back out, it looks a little awkward and, and unusual because of that change. We don't get that with drawing. I don't have the ability to, to magically click on my charcoal drawing here and then bump, up, bump it up in resolution like, you know, 300 times to it gets pixeled. And so thank goodness because I wouldn't want to, to do that. But you can see now, like if I stop the drawing and I, that was all I could do, for the for the time that I had, you could see where we have a focal point, and we have a head a head a little bit more resolved. And so I always tell my students resolve your drawing from the head out if you're working with you know figure more academically, then you'll have a focal point. Now that's that's a that's a that's a it's not a rule. It's just a strategy, and it generally tends to work because they want to get graded and graded well. But for, you know forget about that. But just just think about in terms of of, of uh, just the resolve of the drawing. So getting a little background tone in through here and I held the drawing in many different kinds of ways and in sideways and, and to get the kind of posing I want. I'm going to change that shoulder later, bulges a little bit. It's too high. It's too high overall. And then I draw it a little bit protrude, uh, tr protruded out further. If you didn't know any anatomy, you, you'd think it'd be fine. But after having seen, I step back from it after a while. And I'm going to change. I'll change it a little bit with the chamois. In. It's an easy, easy change. You clean up the ear a little bit. Coming in, get a little bit of tonality in the outline. And I'll clean up the cheek later, probably. <clears throat> so now working the deltoid over. 
you're just working, being mindful of light value edges and contrast. Where is my light coming from? What is the relative value with the value scale inherently in your mind? If you need a value scale, do one or buy one or uh, uh, print one from online to have it next to you. What are your edges? What are your edges doing? That's probably your most challenging thing is to get your edges to control. And then what's the relative contrast between the values that in the light that you're seeing in through. So that deltoid moves over attaches to the tubercle and the humerus and then we get the, the uh, tricep. And I like to draw with a little more of a, I like tone and then I like a, a contour line, kind of a, like a cut line. And other artists, uh, Renaissance artists do that. And then one of my favorites is Pierre Paul Prudhomme, which we've seen before to introduce some of the figure light down edges and contrast. But he super smoothed down his drawings with a stump several times. He would lay in something kind of like we've done with a rougher tone. Then he would take a stump and smooth it down, do it again about four times, and then, then leave the drawing with a sculpted kind of very soft contour line over a very polished, uh, uh, kind of very chalky blend of uh, light and dark charcoal and it worked to a beautiful effect. It's, I'm a little bit more, more rushed. As a matter of fact, I, when I draw figures for myself, they're much more sketchy and, and a little bit more uh, uh, raw or more expressive kind of line. This, this for me is, it's fun to do academic drawings, but it's not, it's not my, um, my favorite thing I do but I do and do enjoy this and I certainly enjoy teaching it so I'm just working the tonality thinking about the core shadow there's a you know, there's a, a reflected light behind there so I'm gonna add a more banded approach in a moment some point in time to that core shadow and then get a little reflected light on that on that deltoid but we jump around a little bit so the end of the neck and underneath the chin a little bit and then get that shoulder from behind the deltoid coming down, get that bulge out, work the shape a little bit further. And coming through. And then the forearm flexors and extensors over. And change that around. Don't be afraid. Also, you can see a little sketch underneath it. Don't be afraid to let your sketch, other sketch parts show through. There's plenty of, it's a drawing, let it be a, a, a private process look to it as well. So kind of rendering out the tricep head a lateral head head there <clears throat> on the outside as it curls and snakes around and will attach down to the condyle very much flexed in this pose so now it's you know it's about settling in so now I just kind of block in this tone over here <clears throat> between the two group the two arms together and I'll separate them for a moment just seeing that as, a, as you squint your eyes you see it about the same value this slight tricep bulge on the medial side coming down to the uh, medial side of the condyle the elbow start to get a little more thorough tone down in the elbow area <clears throat> Light value, edges, contrast, shapes, your understanding of three-dimensional form, all of that plays a vital role. If you don't like what you have, take your chamois and take it off a little bit. Get that head to bulge for me a little bit. <clears throat> so I'm using a little bit more of the tip as I hold the pencil and I turn it the other way. It's kind of a carving approach. I'm always mindful, if you can watch me, in one, in one set of ideas about how I'm holding the pencil, how my hand, and I, I'm mindful of the fact that I'm standing, it, you're right on top of me, over my head a little bit with the camera, but you do get kind of the view I get, is that the angle of the pencil, if it's almost totally horizontal like I have it now, it's very broad, so I get a very smooth, soft edge, mopping, I'm mopping in, and then when I change a little bit, if you see me hit a line, I've got the, the pencil angle tipped higher, so like now it's getting a little bit more of a tip. 
now I've got a little bit broader and I'm getting trying to get an etched line or, or a uh, contour etched kind of a line when I kind of put my pinky out there <clears throat> Separating through edge the, the forearm from the rest of the the hand behind it, giving a contour to there and through. Blocking more of that in. I'll get to more. There's not a lot of detail back there anyway. It's mostly just a shadow shape. It's got some nuance in the shadow, but it's pretty easy just to block that in. So we can start to see this emerge now, giving more volume. And we can kind of see it pulled back out a little bit. So we see that, you know, how we're doing here, what we're doing. You know, as you work deep within a structured area, or not structured area, but with a certain area, you want to constantly pull your eye out step back from your drawing look at all of it you can do that really quickly without stepping back but you just take a moment and look at the holistic whole peripherally if you will and then look at you know when you're going back to your specific area you want to you want to uh, stay away from from pigeonholing your drawing or drawing the trees without seeing the forest for too long I know you have to dig in there with your mind your eye and your mind to noodle into detail, but if you stay too long, you'll forget about the entire, the entire thing, and that can be a little, little dangerous if you're not, if you're not used to that. So you have to kind of be careful, to be careful on that. So let's see what I'm doing here. Now we're going to go into more of the lat. So let's go. Let's pull back in a little bit, a little bit deeper. So pulled back in here a little deeper. <clears throat> Getting into that lat where the coarse shadow is, where that turns lat, and it's the side of the, the uh, pectoral on the right or side, and, uh, more right side or internal side, and through there. So it's a lovely area of, of um, and it's a little a different angle than what we've seen, which is, which is fine. We talked about that. So coarse shadow, that's the first thing I'm thinking about. And it makes, once I add those coarse shadows, it makes everything inside the anatomy or the, the chest area glow with more reflectivity because it's all reflected light into there you can see the flesh as it opens up a little bit and then everything from the rib cage and the lat then to the outer edge where it gets light again is in more bathed and more direct more direct kind of light so you can see where I want to ch I'm going to change that shoulder a little get a little while deeper into the to the drawing and you can see where there's still uh, as I'm going through there's still ways to go on the head the head's going to get tighter but so we're taking our, our long general pass at coarse shadow, uh, cast shadow, defining edges and refining further to get get us probably to to something I would say like a three quarters or seven eighths of a of a way finished and so that we can take one more pass at the drawing later on to get to that final you know finished resolve that we're looking for for, for a nice you know more traditional kind of academic uh, uh, study. So adding a little tone back there, it could go a little darker if you want. I think I pick up a little charcoal stick here. Add that through. Notice again, I'm working my way down the model, not at the head and then at the kneecap and then at the pelvic region and at the chest and then the elbow. It just has a way of flowing all the way, all the way down, which is important just to get us get us in a more processed kind of feeling so we're or, or way of working that makes sense to our eye and, and can get us to a, a, a really nice uh, resolved finish in a, in a, uh, a faster more in, uh, efficient way so now I'm splitting the rib cage where the sternum is finding that sternum down the middle <clears throat> coming down the pectoral and then over to the ribs and the serratus anterior area in the rib cage and through there a little bit more of a a coarse shadow here and then there's a little reflected light for that light lat bulge latissimus bulge so you have to be careful on there in a rib a little pocket I'll make in a moment Take 
Okay, can I erase her and refine a little bit? Places where I need to. Cleaning up the edge. That's why it takes longer now. Now I can slow down. It's not a faster sketch. It's a little slower sketch. Taking time to get what you need. That little little shadow bulge, that rib rib comes down. It's there's a lat lat on top of it a little bit. It's slightly there in the back part, and it's got a little bit of a pock. A little 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 bit of a hole punch, if you will. That makes sense. So we kind of make a little hole in there, and it's pretty. The edges are fairly soft around it. It goes into a little bit. It's like a little. It's a divot of uh, this is the way the shadow pattern laid in. You can see the lat on top of it curling down and then un, un, it really basically it sits over that. It sits over serratus anterior as well which attaches on the inside part of the scapula and then down and fingers over at, a, at an angle to the, rib, to the ribs in the front. So you can see we're starting to emerge that. More coarse shadow, the darkest part of the shadow. And again, you know, the, for the most part, I try to make the rhythm stroking match the direction that I want with the the turn of the of the chest. So this is more of a vertical angle for shadow, and then I'll come across and go the opposite way for a little more direction. Sternal sternal cavity right in through there, little little, little change. You can feel that you can see the nipples there and then the sternal cavity at the bottom of the rib cage and then contouring over and then that's a cast shadow a softer cast shadow from the arm made to the armpit down on the pectoral and you're getting a little bit of reflected light off of the Inside of the tri the uh, tricep, back onto the chest. I'll get you could take that off with a little bit of uh, reflected. Uh, excuse me, um, gum eraser, kneaded eraser. Another little rib tip in through there. So now we're coming through, turning that form a little bit where it's the ribs end, roughly the 10th to 12th rib in there, running through that area and then coming, curling back up and then we get into the oblique and through there. And then continuing on, we'll pull out a little bit here and get a little bit of a, a larger view now so we can, can, can see how the drawing is starting to progress. And so now we, once we add those core shadows and now coming into the detail within and out of the light too as well within the oblique and into the rectus abdominis area, abdominal area, and then we can start to render within those more details within the reflected light uh, as well going through here. So, you know, quite a bit of time in and quite a bit of time still uh, to go uh, as we work. Now I'm going to take the uh, mono eraser and just kind of clean up that little notch into the um, oblique area and just make that a little bit more of a, of a, a nice cleaner read in through there. <clears throat> and so I can take that and clean up that edge and then later on I can either leave that sort of striation of, of contouring in the atmosphere or I can take that out if I, if I want to later on. Either way is fine in terms of what I want to get out of the drawing. We're taking the chest and changing that just a bit. So now's a good time. You kind of know where the drawing is headed, and you see, you know, see improvements and growth, which is which is nice to see. And so you're like, well, okay, now I I know how to take care of a 
to finish out a drawing, you can come back in, in a day or two if you need. If you have, if you don't have the live model, excuse me, little Yanni there, long day. Um, and uh, if you have an image you're working from, you can come back several times. But the power of gesture is is that if you have the skill to just have a gesture and work from that, you can come back anytime you want, which was the case often with art history. Working through getting this the tonal range to begin to clear up and and get cleaner and to get fuller with illuminated reflective light bouncing off of different surfaces. I'm going to change that area of the pectoral, the nipple there, get that a little bit, uh, looks like set in a little bit lower perhaps. Or get the silhouette of it a little bit cleaner if I want. Right into there. Again, don't be afraid to make changes. We'll make some changes. I'll make changes to the leg coming up later. And if you're drawing along with me, you'll see that. <clears throat> Just tightening up in through that area. Getting a nice tight finish get a better silhouette. I'd probably give it a little bit more of a point than than not necessarily have to, but the, getting an accent is over gesturing is, is par part of what I do. Again, we're making interpretive drawings. We're not copying the model. And quite frankly, they give more liveliness to an image as opposed to being photo, photo real, which can deaden out the drawing. If that's not what you are, if you want to be dead on, you know, 100% accurate, then you need you need to trace. That's that's if that's important to you, and that's a, that's a technique too. I won't be teaching that here, but it's a technique where you can use tracing and working the lat through there in the area of the light. <clears throat> I think maybe we'll, we can pop back in a little bit deeper here. All right, so getting in a little bit deeper so you can see this in more detail. Sometimes this is nice to have and to help. And again, toning and contouring is two things I generally keep together as a, as a set. You, can, you don't necessarily have to, but it has a nice aesthetic kind of uh, old, old world sort of look, which is what these kind of techniques are. You know, starting from our Western art traditions, looking at the Renaissance and Baroque. Of course, it's Gothic art before that and earlier and after Romanticism and Neoclassicism as well. But this is more influenced by the Renaissance and by the Baroque than anything else. And so these techniques are in reinterpretive or interpretive of and evoke that time, even though there are differences certainly in style differences in schools, but for the most part, it's very kind of Italian eight oriented in, in somewhat um, Belgian or Flemish in terms of its old worldliness. We're in that by that I mean by the, the 16th and 15th, 16th and 17th century of drawing and also painting practice, but most in this case certainly just drawing. So now we're coming in, filling in the nipple area silhouetted, not a lot of major tightening depot, just enough to render out through that shadowed area, which is important as we get closer into the drawing. We don't, you know, this is interesting, it's, we're working from images and not a model. We can actually bring ourselves closer to the image than we ever could with a live model, especially in a classroom. Again, I talked about this earlier, but if you, if you come in too close to a model, that's going to be invading the space. So, it, I um, I bump up the drawing so we can you can see the close the texture of the drawing that's that's acceptable and interesting. But you know, getting the model in closer and closer doesn't necessarily do you a whole lot of good. And the reason that is because you're seeing it at two different uh, pixel levels, which can be very very confusing if you're trying to work. Um, at, at, a, at, a, at a drawing level that is 
uh, clear to you, I suppose, is the best way to say that. All right, now pulling back out a little bit, taking a more holistic view of everything for just a little bit. So kind of going to tone in back the, the, uh, the arms and hands a little bit here. And I like to make my hands a little larger. You can tell that is obvious. I always teach my students to make them a little bit bigger. The tendency is to make them too small. And that can be problematic. And I'm going to uh, uh, shorten up the, the shoulder a little bit or shrink it a little bit as we go deeper into the, into the drawing a little bit. But generally, most students, if you're younger at drawing, will draw the feet and the hands a little bit uh, at... Uh, smaller sizes and that and that gets uh, uh, to looking awkward so go a little bit a little bit larger in both and you'll be probably more satisfied with the look that you have so just toning in and cleaning up a little bit of the run of the hands here getting them silhouetted in and we'll take on a little bit of that cloth to just getting getting that to get the basic sort of block in lay in and getting a little bit more time into that that particular area. Just being careful with the pose and trying not to get too detailed in that area. It's not as important as the head unless you're doing hand studies or close-up of the hand. So again, you know, a point being is about the relationship to the the image as as you're drawing or and or uh, painting it. And again, the you know working from images has its limitations, as does the live model. But in this case, especially, you don't get the opportunity in the live setting as to pull in relatively close and see tons of detail. You get a, a station pointer in a position within your your um, your cone of vision. You you get your station point, and you don't really change it. You, again, you really don't want to get up and stand up if you're sitting, or sit down if you're standing, because you want those to be. Um, uh, cleaned out and or excuse me you want that cleaned out but you want them to be um, uh, uh, set in and uh, you want them to be um, uh, station stationary and so that you could be consistent you're just going to figure out you know toning in here now a little bit of the uh, epicondyle area of the of the elbow and a little bit of the tricep it comes down and connects and that will break your radialis or just the area of the arm there and toning that in. I'm going to get super detailed. Most of that's in shadow and it's not very clear but we get a silhouette of that and that could be altered and changed as needed. Be moved around. Kind of just tweak that or change that bulge in through there as, as per needed. Get a little bit more getting clear. You know again getting clear as we come down the drawing. Can you kind of restart the drawing as you go over and over this longer term kind of uh, drawings and poses and, and see where your mistakes are and if you want to change them. If they're, if they're too egregious, sometimes you just start over and if they're just small, you just you live with them and they're fine and nobody really knows until ever. Or if you, if you want to make some serious changes, we'll, we'll make some. We'll make some on the, on the leg a little bit later and we'll widen it up just a, just a little bit as much as I can and then tighten up that shoulder region later. So we've got that working here for us. Turn the hand, getting that a little bit more detailed and through the kind of an incisive kind of a line-ish tone line just as a stylistic kind of thing. Getting a little contour around there to make that a little bit less flat on the image. <clears throat> in the drawing itself. <clears throat> so reaching for a softer, just a little bit more again, a softer pencil. So we're going to get into the more coarse shadow in this, in this hip trochanter obliqueish area region and getting a little detailed and tighter in through here. Let's pull in a little bit tighter. So pull in for a little clarity's sake. So again, you know, as you're as you're making drawings and you have images, if you can't, you know, work from a live model, you know, you just have to be a little bit careful when you when you pull into an image, you know, too tight. You're trying to render minutia in within 
because there's a certain again a distance that you're relatively having when that image was shot. So, you know, I believed in in training in draftsmen and draftswomen, people who draw holistically. So mostly from the figure, but also from images and also from imagination. So from the figure, primarily from photographic reference, from master studies, and also from imagination, imaginative drawing and training. All of that holistically, I think, you know, helps quite a bit. But if you're just working from JPEGs or photos only, you miss so much nuance and you miss that that just being that residual textural feeling of being in front of a live a live model. I think that's that's some really important to get. Some of us can't necessarily get there yet until you get into a program that has that. But if you're looking at art schools, please make sure that they, they offer that or if they can have that for you. It's important to get get in front of that live nude nude model. I mean you could do it on your own. That might be a little awkward or you can hire your own models which might be less awkward too as well. Partner uh, you know, a good friend, I suppose, but you get the idea. You're getting core shadow turning, and it's how you get illumination on that leg, and then core shadow as it turns across the form of the leg, getting that little kind of incisive, sort of abbreviated contour line. And then you look at other master drawings, so you get these tiny little lines like Durer that are so meticulous that just and it becomes you know a, a patience kind of thing so I use tone I kind of uh, hedge on that I use a tone and I use a little bit of a, a contour line to to give a little bit of both of that for these sort of intermediate long kind of poses really three hour poses I know some of these if you're, you're watching a video and it's narrated it can get a little you know, depending on your interest level, it might be a little much. I get that for some of you. And some of you, it's like, give me more, give me more. It's great. I love that. Um, this is not a very long drawing at all. I want to get that, you know, cleared up a little bit. You know, drawings can take weeks, months, um, year might be a little bit, depending upon the, the contemporary approach. But it can be quite long, depending upon the, the uh, character and or the you know, necessity. Here, you know, these are for study for academic purposes. They're traditional. This is not not terribly long. Uh, French academic ateliers and studios in the 17th, 18th century might uh, assign a drawing for a semester, one final finished long, you know, painting and pose that has to be meticulously, you know, finalized. That that would be a, this would be a long way from that. These are still that. This would be pretty much in a in a raw face. I'm gonna take the chamois now and clean that up a little bit. See, every time I, I pick that up, I take it and wipe away or wipe out in the little tummy tuck area where the tummy comes in. You get he's so thin that you get that folding that it's super thin people can get without a lot of subcutaneous body fat. I've never been one of those people. Darn it. So you get a little bit more separation between the the uh, center part of the sheath of the abdominals, a little bit more of the oblique, just kind of just blending and smoothing, using the tools we go in to dig through there, get a little bit cleaner with our approach as we render render through. Core shadow and then reflected line and then as that curls over we get a little cast shadow from the oblique back onto the rectus abdominis that area was through there. So if you can think logically as you go through there as you're drawing, I don't, I don't necessarily think that consciously out loud but as I'm drawing I see it and react to it and the more time I'd spent drawing I can react to that and clean that up a little bit. So now we're going to tone this back and go a little darker now now that we've after our mop in, we can start to take this and go darker. Getting that area, the sartorius, 
the three-fingered gap where it gets a little straighter into the pubic and pubic symphysis in the testicle penis region. We just abbreviate those. Come through. So won't need any major lessons on any kind of you know pubic anatomy. I think we can we've all kind of figured that out by now. So we get into the leg and <clears throat> render this out and you're going to see me later on take it out and change it. So I want you to see all this process if you're going for the long long term one. So again, you see tone and then you see contour on top of tone. It's that connection between the two that really gets us a connection to to uh, Baroque and Renaissance drawing and also painting. And just getting those edges split from from coarse shadow and then change and turn of the abdo lower abdominal region and separation and working edges, clear edges, sharp edges, clean edges versus semi-blurred edges or semi-soft edges and getting into the shape of the genitals here, the testicle and in uh, penis area, egg form, cylinder, and then we can hit a little bit of light on them in a moment. <clears throat> Do a little bit of light on those. Turning that sartorius region, tensor fascia lata region, is kind of an egg form. It bul bulky bulges, he protrudes out a little bit. Top of the testicle there, a little bit of light on the egg form, a little bit of light coming off the cylinder. Kind of a pointed, obviously just pointed cylinder, that's about all you need. Crazy through there, we can get a little bit more detail I suppose, but you don't need a whole lot there unless you're doing a close-up study of your own want. <clears throat> But since it's long term, we can get in a little bit, a little bit closer. There's a little core shadow on the egg form there. And we can draw a little bit of the shaft and then the top head of that acorn shape. quality there to it. And underneath the abductor regions as they open and close the from the pubic symphysis. Cleaning up that little edge and through there a little bit. <clears throat> So looking and looking, you, know, you can tell I look and think, looking and thinking, and say, okay, so what? What I'm seeing in there to get this to work for me? And coming around the form and then uh, slightly kind of blending that in with my finger a little bit. But you, sometimes I'll just pop my finger in there to get a little tone, like a smoother edge to blend that out and over. And it's all cast shadow on that leg, that thigh. And it, it, it's not completely dark. It's darker, but it's not completely dense. It's got variation within the cast shadow. There's nothing really on much on the model that's got a complete dense uh, dark uh, that will eat it up for too long. And as long as we're not in a vacuum and we have reflected light. Now, artists can play around with that concept and do things differently and change and alter to their needs. Comic book artists, graphic novelists do that with shape and shadow all the time. Uh, animators to simplify that. Here we're going for a more 
uh, illuminated all over kind of light quality. So a little bit of a bulge there in the abductor is that sits at muscles, this grouping of four or five muscles that sit in through on the pubic symphysis and attach on over to the femur over and around and there you get nicely coming through and you get that leg turning over, turning around and turning through and we get over to the knee <clears throat> A bit, little bit darker with the reflected light and the pop. You can leave it like that if you want. It's a little bit too light. It's coming through and cleaning that up. Taking our time to unify all this material into the the drawing here. Getting that undercut to turn in through here. There's you've got. The abductors in there, you've got the sartorius coming down, that belt-like form from the knee up to the hip. And then you've got a little bit underneath there, that extra little line underneath the very lower part of the, of the thigh. That's the another muscle underneath there, the semi-tendinous and semi-membranous together that come around and over that attach to the tibia area in front, the condyle. A lot of activity going on in that knee in terms of different muscles and tendons coming to literally head on the femur, the patella, and then the tibia and fibia. It's a lot going on. Yeah, we're kind of contouring around this leg. So you get the rectus femoris really starting to show here. And also the vastus medialis creating that nice little form shadow and a little bit of a cast shadow with a pocket in between that leg. Kind of forming the, shaping the eraser and then Going to clean up a little bit of an area in here. That's my eraser right there, my chamois. An added subtractive drawing. That'll take it out, and the eraser will be drawing with the light, light proper. <clears throat> kind of cleaning that around and shaping that contouring around that form. I know it's pretty slow, it's pretty long. These are long-term poses, longish, long-term poses. Feeling the patella, the condyle, the top of the femur as they come together and they'll open up and it's held by by tendons and also uh, certainly ligaments and also tendons with the muscles. Getting that to fall over the form. The volume in, in, of the form in, in the light through there. <clears throat> Give a little bit more to that form underneath it really inflects and bulges out in that particular viewpoint. Some some views have, have more uh, uh, of a bulge quality and then other views don't. They're a little bit flatter. Depends on the nature of the of the lighting and also the nature of the pose uh, too as well. That condyle tip of the femur. The undergirding there, that sartorius and also the tendon. Mm -mm, turning in through and it's ready to get into contour excuse me, core shadow of the knee.
and they're about ready to get there. Now it's going to start to break now. We can get to the core shadow where the light ends and the shadow begins. And quite a bit of that knee is in reflected light. And then we've got some around. You can see where that's sheathed now. The patella starts to emerge as a disc, kind of a triangular ovoid in flat sort of disc sitting on top with the connection of the patellar ligament on top and then getting into the tibia there, the triangular spot are called the kneeling point of the head of that where ligaments and tendons will connect. So just cleaning up that region, and you can tell that the the the, the process is 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 uh, to get the bald head out of the way. It's just to get my head out of the way, but the the process is to you know get in there to the shadow shapes, and now we can as soon as we have a longer pose, we can start to dig in there and really see see what's happening with the, the kind of the, the cleaning up of the drawing and the rendering of the drawing. So I can smudge that out and and redraw that a little bit later. <clears throat> but uh, to uh, you know, hit your core shell and start hitting details when you need in those shadow shapes. So finding that, you know, re reinvigorating the dark near the shadow shape, and then hitting what's going to be a little bit now of the core shadows. It turns through that kneeling point of the knee and through here. A little deeper with the core shadow, but we've got to leave a little bit of reflected line on the back side. It's harder to see that in the image, but you'll have to leave some on the back side. Toning over that calf, turn that calf a little bit, the, the contouring, finding underneath where the soleus is, and then coming in the lower leg. That bulge in through there. And you get a little beginning of a shape of the bone of the of the femur, especially in the medial side. It's that kind of torqued look and turn, and it gets triangular and then boxy at the top because there's not a lot of of muscle in that part of the leg. So it gets very what we call the shin, a little bit of a curve of that bone as it comes down. And we're adding a little core shadow there, and then we want to just that bone gets a little shaved in that direction. So I'm going to contour a little bit in that direction, and then go down the length a little bit of core core shadow too. It's just a little bit darker than the, than the very tip edge of that uh, reflected line. And coming down, and getting a little bit more of the condyle. I always seem to go back and get a little bit of here and there. I, you know, I, the rendering's fine on the leg, but ultimately, it, it, uh, I wanted to make a, a case for. Since it's a little out of position, we can make a case for changing it. And I could have as easy as just as well left it. Coming down the top of the foot, bringing it in line with resting on the pedestal a little bit there. Down to the tip of the bone of the tibia. On the medial side, the condyle will be very exposed, very bony there, which we commonly known obviously as the ankle. Getting that to rest in that position. The other side of the lateral will be lower, actually. Get that feeling. And 
and rendering out this side here. And continue to turn on, turn the contour on to the, uh, the position of the leg. <clears throat> I think now we can pull out the screen a little bit. Here we can see the foot in relationship to the leg a bit. So that negative space between, again, the ankle and the other knee is a little bit narrower. Again, I don't mind it, but it is a little bit off. The the leg to the uh, left leg uh, in, in the image is a little, uh, in the model, is uh, a little not quite as straight. Um, again, I give, I give probably an over gesture there. Um, and so it it works without the change, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it for the sake of, of uh, study and, and learning. I'll I'll will take it out later on. I won't do it here, but I'll take it out, and you'll see uh, see the changes that I make through that. And I think it's important for you to see it. So uh, don't worry about making mistakes. You can change them no matter uh, almost any stage of the game, especially especially with charcoal. Um, so you'll feel that 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 is a vers uh, vital, versatile, uh, changeable, mutable uh, material that can be altered quite a bit. So you know, two two things that are that are you miss a little bit with the leg. The the one I'm working on now is not quite as bent, and the one that's uh, to the left of it is 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 a little bit straighter too. Both of those will make that negative space uh, wider. I just chose to to change one just for the sake of time a little bit a little bit later on. Ultimately it doesn't bother me with the pose, but again if you over gesture like I generally do, you're gonna miss a little bit. I probably, you know, half the time will will gesture deeper than maybe what the model uh, calls for just to give uh, and so over, probably over trained to give a lot of movement to my drawings. And so um, and this is a case good case to show this I think is really important. It's, make those changes because there's nothing wrong with any of these leg renderings proportionally they're scaled quite a bit it's just a little bit different position than what what your image what the image is re giving us for uh, a read to as well all right so fig feeling that out and feeling pretty pretty clear about that foot and we can get find a little bit of uh, time now to do a little bit of uh, work on the on the uh, platform here Yep, so uh, working on you know the platform and just getting the, the basics of it. I'm not going to go into tons of detail with the platform. It's not that important. You can do anything you want to. You could make it a rock or a bale of hay or you could make it trees or bushes or um, it's something different than what it is in, in terms of the, the image of, uh, in your image than what the reference material is doing too as well. So that's mutable. And just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll push through that. So I'll work now this bottom uh, knee to uh, uh, the ankle and, and, and foot, the calf uh, region. It's pretty pretty set in. And now I'll just tend to render out a little bit more of the bone and ligament formation here on the knee. Just continuing on. And so it's in partial shadow. Again, it's top lit, so that's going to make it in partial shadow. Uh, because of the leg and the knee. Now I have the leg a little bit more bent, which I kind of like better than the pose. So, you know, there's some instances where I'll, I'll over gesture, I'll change, and, um, and most of the times, you know, I find that uh, yeah, that's kind of what I do and what I want, um, and I, I change poses often. I think, don't think I talk about that enough. Um, I, I generally stay away from true horizontal, true vertical kind of functions in the figure it tends to stiffen things up um, however that you know in teaching that's a little tough for students because it changes the pose where they're yeah uh, they're used to seeing maybe being a little bit more um, regimented or a uh, a little bit more uh, strict with a pose that's why if you if you are if you're that type of person sight sizing um, academic kind of realism might be for you. I find that to be a little too stiff for me. But then when you measure visually sight and in sight you're, you're measuring back onto your paper, it's a much, much slower process. 
um, but it, it, it tends to take care of any any kind any kind of and I mean emphasize strongly any any kind of minor changes with the pose. Um, again, these are more Renaissance techniques, borrowing you know 650 years from Michelangelo, Michelangelo Leonardo, Raphael, uh, Titian, etc. Tintoretto and this kind of uh, uh, drawing leaves you with uh, some room for interpretation. And then, of course, you get into other movements through art history, uh, German Expressionism, for instance, and you get uh, sensual free, free expression with uh, scale, proportion, uh, volume, figure, all of it. It becomes really distorted. Here, we're, we're not. So there's there's certainly a believability to the to this drawing, but there are some changes. So I want to make sure you're clear about that as well. So just kind of keeping this slow, working the kind of the tibia fibula region, uh, what we'll call the the kneeling point of the, the tibula. <clears throat> And just taking my time to render some of the shadow through on the side of the cylindrical egg form of the leg. And moving around the calf pretty slow. If you're working along with me, you take it slow and you can make these changes too. So, you know, as we do this drawing, or if you're just watching on your own without drawing, that's fine too to get little techniques. Uh, I will change that bent leg, um, the other leg on the right there, later on, so there will be a major change, because I wanted you to see that. I do that in, with a couple of these longer the pose section of the figure to show you how, you know, we all want to make changes, and you don't have to be perfect, because you can, you can alter and, and change as your needs, and then you'll, you'll grow into that, and, and, and be kind of fearless in what you can do with the drawing uh, for practice or for finish and change as you need and it can be exhilarating. It can be frustrating too but also you can find that, that, that uh, if you go back and alter and change you might want to correct a pose and in my case a little bit or you might want to alter a pose like I show you in long pose one where uh, it's better moved or changed uh, a little bit. And here I'm going to take out again with the chamois becomes an eraser and the using the actual eraser again becomes the light with an additive subtractive uh, kind of process here. So just putting, you know, all this is in relative shadow so the tone of the paper does a lot of the work for us, doesn't it? So we get a little light cascading from the top of the calf down to kind of the center down to sort of the end of the tendons before we get to the, the ankle, the malleoli of the, the medial and the lateral areas and through there and I'll just kind of indicate the toes. It's pretty much a, a blocky foreshortened view. You know, you notice in the image again when you, the, the, the toes, the, the toes curl on the edges, the, the big toe will point inward and then the pinky toe on the end will point inward to the b bulk of the foot. However, remember that the smaller toes um, are grabbers where the big toe points uh, gives you more stability points uh, upward uh, in, in, into space. So the big toe you could tell even in here in that in an image on the right where the big toe points up and the smaller the, the rest of the the, the toes uh, point and are point, pointing downward and grabbing onto the uh, floor. You could probably actually be okay with walking without uh, having your big toe removed, but if you start removing the pinky and the small toes, you're going to have more trouble stabilizing and balancing. It's pretty. It's kind of kind of counter counterintuitive, I think, that way about about the feet. And I just indicate the just the the toe area. I'm not going to go into detail since it's so small. That's another thing you can learn is to shorthand some of this with a smaller drawing. These are uh, American size, 18 inches by 24 inch piece of paper so uh, when you're making a what is a relatively smaller drawing you can indicate some of these forms especially in the toes and in the the hands those digits and then when you get bigger drawings you can go for um, more detail on those those tiny you know specific you know kinds of areas all right so I've pulled out the view to uh, more um, full view of the of the the model here, so we're back, give the thumbs up, took a little breaks there. 
And so now I'm going to, uh, essentially I've got everything laid in like I want. Now I'm going to start refining from the, the head down and make changes. And I'll also make changes to that uh, shoulder uh, a little bit. It's, you know, it's still big, it sticks out. So we'll work with this uh, head a little bit. And then we'll dive in uh, a little deeper here in a moment and I'll show you some details. So you get a, a shot of my beautiful balding, balding head there, or pretty much bald all the way. Uh, head there. Um, and again, now as we kind of pull out, you can see we're looking at the image. I stop, draw a little bit, look at the image. And then this is good to see again with the uh, triangle that I have, that plastic um, uh, triangle that's used for drafting or drawing perspective and, and whatever you want. And I use it also as, as a protector of my hand. So you notice I have it laying on the paper. And then I put my hand over it to keep my hand off the uh, surface of the uh, drawing so I don't smudge the drawing with my hand or get charcoal on my hand. That's important technique to, to learn there and you get a, a close-up view there. It's it's essential to keep your surface clean uh, for the most part. I mean there, there are exceptions to that rule when you're drawing a little bit more loosely or I would say you know expressively whatever that means meaning that's what you want. You want to smudge kind of look here we don't. Uh, so we want to change that or keep that technique um, um, non, or keep our paper, excuse me, non, non smudgy there. So now just rendering through um, fine tuning ear, the face, etc. And I'll vacillate between using uh, additive methods or drawing with the charcoal and subtractive methods or drawing with the uh, Japanese mono eraser and using a little bit of both. That's the beauty, I think, of additive subtractive drawing is you get um, to use both to to make your drawing you know come alive uh, here as well so the drawing is really pretty set you know stylistically it's in, in kind of baroque ish style with some hatching and quite a bit of hatching and some tone in there and so there's some some alterations or changes I made and you know one another big one I'm going to make is that shoulder the deltoid area I'm going to uh, yeah, de-emphasize some of that it's a little a little bit bulky and poochy as it comes out and I'll change that in a little while um, but that's that's important to to know I could have left it but I think it, it it's better if I if I do change it so you know again just taking my time and rendering through here I'm kind of again taking some some pains to keep the the stroking pattern rhythmic and moving across forms to give it flow and movement throughout the the drawing so if you you see how I'm drawing now and I'm thinking about a stroking pattern I mean I could take hours and hours and blend and, and smooth this out like a, a Pierre Paul Pierre uh, Prudhomme uh, drawing but um, that's really not the uh, the point here the point here is to get all the elements together and and I kind of little, I like a little bit looser style, more like a, I would say a Tintoretto, maybe a Tiepolo, a little bit um, in terms of Baroque, just stylings, if you will, in drawing. So getting into the shape orientation or detail, a lot of my thinking here is, as I look at the image, or if I was working from the live model, it'd be the same now, is to, um, really vacillate or move between thinking two-dimensional and looking at just uh, shapes of light, shapes of dark, and also um, what are the forms themselves um, doing? Is it a cylinder? Is it a, a egg-like form? Is it a box-like form? And how does light react onto it? And then uh, ultimately, what it, what is the form I'm drawing? Is it a nostril here? And that, that's already kind of egg-like and sort of a cascading tube that, that turns downward and opens into an opening of the nostril which is kind of triangular. So all that's going on in my head super fast now since I've been doing this since I was you know uh, pretty 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 really 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 young small and I'm 50 now so I've been doing it quite a while and it comes um, with much obviously much greater ease and so take heart if you're if you're inexperienced at drawing getting your mileage or your drawing time in is, is essential to not only speed things up speed is not necessarily important accuracy is so now delineating a little bit of the socket area of the eye with the lid and in 
It becomes at this level, since it's so small and we've got a small surface, you don't need every detail. What you need, and this is a tough lesson to learn, is, is using symbols, um, value shapes, you know, to get that highlight there against the dark of the pupil and iris. We, obviously, we can't see the, the, the pupil inside the iris. It's just too small. So we want to, we want to, to simplify down a little bit, unless you're going for some kind of hyper-realist you know, tiny, tiny, tiny area, which I don't, I don't really prefer to do. This is about as tight as I like. I prefer to get with academic kind of work. And quite frankly, you didn't see photorealism until the 20th century. Nobody really did that. And certainly the Impressions didn't. They went the other way with that. It wasn't really until Richard Estes in the 60s, late, maybe late 50s, but certainly in the 60s, 70s, that you saw photorealism using a photograph almost verbatim as a finishing way to make art, which can be interesting. It is, is is interesting, certainly, as well. Working the side of the nostril, a little bit of the, the shadow there, cast shadow, core shadow, where the cheek ends and the nostril begins. So it's all about settling in now for that. This might be your day's work to do, to spend an hour or two hours if you have time or 30 minutes or whatever and, and kind of just pick away at you know the drawing. This drawing is about three hours and in 50 minutes of work and I think I spend a, a couple of sessions doing this. I'll come in early into my office and work before I teach and then I'll, I'll leave for the day and go home to my own studio and do other things or go home and do whatever I need to do and then the next day I'll pick up and turn the camera on and just you know finish it out so it winds up being maybe a couple of days, but the entire session is about three, three and a half or so hours, and then talking through it. <clears throat> so we're pulling together. This is an interesting little section here where he's got a little cast shadow coming from his shoulder onto his cheek and chin from the light source shining on the deltoid. So it's got a little bit of a, a darker area. I'll need to add some. And a little bit. I'm working now through the through the jowl, the cheek, back into the the mouth region here. You know, but we're taking and lifting out what I need. And if so, you it's in a way you kind of overdraw with the tone, or the tone covers everything, and then you work your shadows. And then as you refine, you start to take those lighter toned values and and. Uh, erase or erase those out and what you wind up with is a pretty accurate if you're being you know very accurate a really accurate rendition here and then you can tweak and in change with dark and you you kind of move back and forth between additive and and subtractive processes pretty quickly and you know you work that and work that and work that and work it until it gets to wherever you want it to be finished you want it to be super tight that might take you know, this is almost a you know, three and a half, four hour drawing, and then it might take you another, you know, 12, 15, 20 hours, whatever it takes to finish out something that's super tight. This is still fairly quick. quick believe it or not, it's still a fairly quick sketch. Um, you know, French academists in the 19th century would, 18th, 19th century, they would spend um, months on one, on one drawing, one painting for the semester's kind of work to, to, uh, to get that part of it was they didn't have imagery to work with and part of it was getting the lighting correct for the day Electric without electricity or um, candlelight can only suffice so if you're using for instance northern light you might only get two hours of studio time until the light changes dramatically that you just can't you can't um, work with the model or if if you're working under more diffused cloudy conditions with a light overhead in an atelier in say Paris and somewhere in uh, in in, uh, in London maybe at that time um, the sunny day versus a cloudy day could be a, a dramatic change I would probably want to work under a cloudy day where the light is more diffused completely so a lot of little complexities there so now I'm picking back up the pencil notice I've got I'm holding it in the writing technique so you know we're getting in there really really tight and so that's where I need that writing uh, technique and I think I've got a medium maybe here 
for these tinier strokes and just delineating some of the differences between the cheek and a little bit where the sideburn is to the hair. And again, notice I don't pull my photograph in deeper. And this is a problem with when you're not working from the live model. That's why it's important to work a lot, if not exclusively, from the live model as best you can. And the reason why is, is that if you begin to draw and we're pulled down in our view of the photograph, this is a very important, pay, really pay special attention to this, is, you know, what is our distance in the image from Crokey Cafe that we're working from? Well, it's probably from the model, the camera, I'm going to guess somewhere between minimally six feet to maximum probably 12 to 15 feet. I'm guessing it's somewhere between eight and 10 feet, I bet. So you don't want to change the photograph size, meaning that, okay, what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a high res image and you begin then to go deeper into that photograph and try to render when you pop the photograph up in resolution and pull in really close, let's say to the ear or the shadow side of the face, and then you you see all that and you rent over render in that area and then you pull the 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 look at your drawing and then you, you wonder why why is it kind of hyper focused in such a small distant kind of level uh, you might have some some issues with focus and over detailing in areas so we want to make our drawing understandable this is a very intellectual uh, mental kind of thing where you have to be self-aware what's the distance when you finish your drawing that you're the reality that you're creating because what you don't get the luxury of what you don't get when you have a live model is to move up super super close because that's just a, vi a violation of a person's space, I suppose, unless it's your significant other, then that might be certainly fine. But in, in, in most cases, when you're using a live model, professional model, and also when you're in a classroom of maybe 10, 12, 15, in our case, sometimes 20 students, that's just not possible for many reasons. Just it's too crowded and you can invade the, the model space as well. So you only have one distance and you have to obey generally speaking what it is that the the distance is, that you're drawing under relates to to the to the eyes that I hope that makes makes sense for you because I think that's important to 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 make clear is you don't want to over render in areas where you, know, you have a drawing that looks like well okay you're eight feet away but then you're also drawing up close where it's you know six inches away from the model and you and then you pull back and you're drawing you're like well that 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 doesn't look quite right so you know artists from the 19th century middle of the 19th century century um, and then back through time didn't have that issue to work with we do now since we have photographic means or digital means whatever that takes so here I see my my finger I'm just kind of rendering that eye in shadow to kind of pull the eye a little bit wider and out and I dab dab my finger in there to, just to get a little bit of that charcoal to smudge if it's too light I stuck a little little highlight on the kind of the, just a slight one a darker highlight on the crease of the of the, the eye socket where it ends on the right just to separate just a little bit I didn't necessarily see it on the model this is something I, I created to invent it and I've got a little bit more reflected light on the um, side of the head too. So hopefully you understand what I just described is, is spatial difference in in your drawing, especially when you're drawing for academic purposes. Now everything I just said about all that spatial change can be ignored if you're doing something expressive and you want some some new purpose or new way of seeing things. That might be fresh and interesting to have different areas of focus and depth changes. That's what makes you know, contemporary art interesting is all the changes in, in, in ways of working that um, that are more idiosyncratic to each to each artist. We really didn't have that kind of thinking in the 19th century. It wasn't until really the 20th with Cubism and, and Dada really that we got more individual um, approaches all the time. Everybody's trying to be you know, individual and come up with something new and fresh, whereas before it wasn't the case. You followed a guild style or a master style and you you enveloped that and you went out and made 
and got commissions and made a living based off of that technique, etc. And it was more like a trade. Here now, everything is it's self-expression, which, which by and large, I think is exciting, but more difficult to certainly to teach because there's no one right or wrong way. But I think that's where we're at with art. And who knows, that might change in, in 300 years. Who knows what we're going to do. I won't be around to see that. But that you never know what, what changes under what political system uh, we might be living under in the future as human beings. Is it more free or less free? And I'm assuming that the less free we would be, the more rigid the art could be. If it's completely sanctioned by... Uh, by an authoritative or totalitarian kind of kind of state. That was a lot in that description. So, so I think you know, getting back to just technique is uh, now. I'm, now I'm taking the white of the charcoal pencil. What I'm saying here, when I pick up the white, is I'm saying I'm in the final throes of finishing out this area. So I pop in a little kiss of a highlight, glossier highlight on the eye to make it a little bit wetter. I see a touch on the ear. I can make it. I don't want to overdo this part. I can't emphasize enough that you don't want to overdo this in this particular technique. The tendency for students will be to, when they pick up this white charcoal, is to really overdo it. You can kind of draw you know, in through these areas, but generally I'm drawing with the white charcoal in areas that are cleaned out of any charcoal. It's just the stained paper, and I want to pick up a little bit more white value. Now, if you start overusing the white charcoal, then you're kind of using a chalk pastel technique because it's going to start blending into the darker middle tone charcoal values, and it's going to give you uh, a more painterly approach, which is a slightly different technique. Maybe it's something I'll show you in a later a later time um, in in in, um, in 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 our in my videos here. Sorry, and that, that to show you a little bit different technique. It's kind of it's again it's like chalk blending, which is really gets really quite frankly uh, very painterly. It can be kind of uh, again in it very very much an interesting in technique, but a little bit different than what we're going for uh, here, for sure. So back on now the charcoal, just to, just to fine tune all of this. You know, I could use a stump, which is a piece, that piece of charcoal, uh, or excuse me, cardboard stick to blend. I don't, I'm not a big stump user. I don't really prefer to do that, but you, you can use it to blend. I'll just use my finger. I'll just that's why I generally probably have gravitated and when I do academic drawings to more a little slightly more um, uh, con uh, 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 hatch. That's what I'm trying to think. Excuse me, I got so much to go uh, thinking about a hatching kind of technique where I'm just using small strokes as well. But you can blend if you want. Um, but again I'm Students can can overblend at times, and it gets can be a little little too blended out. You kind of blend away some of the character. You have to be careful of of that as well. So let's see what I'm up to here. So now going into that cast shadow, we're going to tighten up that look. It's a little harder edged, so it's got a little bit of the shoulder shape on cast onto the chin and onto the neck region, so I want to tighten up that area a little bit further here. And that's essentially what I'm going to do um, for the rest of the figure is, is, is do uh, this tightening to the next kind of next what I want to be for a kind of a, a finished longer medium longer pose is just to tighten up to this level and you'll see me work down the entire the entire figure here. Sorry that camera gets out of focus a little bit. It had sometimes it can't read between my my bald head and, and the image. So it gets a little bit blurry. So when I was a student, this was probably the hardest part to to get for me. I could I was really good at volume and gesture and scale and proportion. And then finishing took a lot while a while longer because I'd never 
I had never done the, the finishing, finishing part, and, and it took a while for me to, to get the hang of the fine tuning. But ultimately, at this level, it's really the same as some of the the the, the general levels or the the macro levels, if you will, of, of the drawing. It's just on a on a on a minor scale. So everything you can relate back to light, value, edges, and certainly contrasts. And and it doesn't matter what level you're working um, on, whether it's these small levels or larger levels. It's really kind of all the all the same here. Okay, so I pulled back out. I um, uh, cut out some of the parts where I work on the shoulder because I'm going to go back and, and correct or change that lower that uh, deltoid scapula area a little bit as it's too too high a little bit later. So I thought I would just skip over that. But I really took took uh, great care to render the same way I did through uh, the the head uh, region. Now working the side of the the lat, the torso, rib cage, and serratus anterior area, and again looking for now um, an anatomical features, but also shadow shapes. So if you can think through kind of three or four different levels, you're thinking about light, value, edges, and contrasts, um, and you're thinking shape, which can be flat, and looking at different different types of shapes uh, that that make up some of these regions, but then also what are its 3D components? It's kind of the whole chest area and the light's kind of a barrel, a part of a larger barrel or turning cylinder of the, the rib cage. So you have to think in that way. And then generally you want to think about, okay, there's a little bit of the lap there and coming down and then the end of the, the rib cage and onto the, a little bit of the um, erector spinae muscles and the oblique now that I'm working through here. So you're, you're working on different different mental levels as you're working, you know, your your drawing uh, further. So keep that in mind. It's a pretty complex activity, but take heart. Your brain can handle it. You just need some time practicing getting all of that information to, to uh, be experienced and um, um, your brain starts to handle it and then when you when you really are making you're doing well you're not really thinking about it so much as you're just reacting and but you can't do that without really some some time and experience so working through the line taking care to get these edges situated working the leg here sartorius tensor fascia lata region here rectus femoris <clears throat> being you know just being careful about where I lay down you know my triangle uh, and pick up the triangle so you notice I pick it up I move it around I don't slide it around because it'll start to smear if I do that. So I see students do that. They do pretty well with keeping their hand off their drawing, but then they start to slide it around. And you have to be careful not to do that because that can get you caught with um, you know, a craft issue that takes some of the, the beauty and look of what you're trying to finish or accomplish out of, out of your drawing. And you don't want you don't want to do that so much. So just kind of rendering through some of the reflected light into the uh, abdominal, you know, belly region and through here. Let's pop in a little bit closer. Yeah, we can see that a little bit up close better to give you a little bit of better feeling for what I'm doing there. So I've got a little bit of that oblique right in through there, that, that bulb, that muscle that's a little bit more flexed, and then it catches a little bit of light on um, the lower uh, rectus abdominal uh, muscle and through there it catches a little touch which is kind of like a worm a cylinder shape so I can tighten that up by taking either my eraser in this case or I could use my charcoal pencil if I need to it depends on if it's too light I'll darken it in with additive processes and if it's too dark I'll go back with subtractive processes and, and 
in the same way with with edges which are you know tantamountly important is is do I need a tighter edge do I need a softer edge what kind of eraser do I use and do I need to harden that or soften so his belly believe it or not he does have a little extra fat it's pretty thin uh, thin fellow but uh, generally in in the thinnest of folks they'll have a little extra it's a little more of a skin than fat and it will fold and you can see where it rolls a little bit so I'll tighten up that line a little bit uh, further. It's actually more grabbable and elastic than those folks who are are heavier, have more subcutaneous fat. It's harder to actually to grab onto it because there's there's just kind of a bulkier, more more bulk to that. So just kind of turning that with a little uh, contouring subtraction in through there, so you get the look of a little bit of both additive and subtractive contouring, which I like the look of. If you don't, then don't do it. Do do whatever it is that you want to do, however you want to finish out a drawing. This is less about style and more about just a more generalized kind of long-term, you know, poses. Style can come later into advanced study, advanced classes if you take classes, and that's what those are about is finding independent um, ways of, of making your, your work come alive. So I'm using more medium kind of Japanese mono eraser. You can see I pick up two. Whenever I have the red one on the tip there, it's a little bit finer, and this blue one is a little bit more of a medium tip or more blunt work. Again, thinking about the turn of a cylinder as I work some of these mid-tone highlights in through this region. Always moving and thinking about shape, thinking about the appropriate form I want to 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 uh, conceive in my mind. Is it a cylinder? Again, a box, and it could be multiples of that. Catching the edge of the negative space between the outer part of the chest region and the background tone. Bringing that over. Just tightening that up. Getting that set in. <clears throat> and you can go back and pick up a little bit of darker area there. That nipple area is a little bit too peaked, so I can bring that subtly back through. And then give a little bit of contouring in the back, and I can change the background later. Just want to tighten up that shape. And you can do this in painting. It's just a little bit more tedious because you have to think about dipping into the color and the value and get the right uh, color and value every time you do that. That's why painting's a little, generally a little bit, a little bit slower. And I'll just tighten up this edge, bring out the nipple peak there, just a little bit lower, roughly in through that region. Smoothing that out. A little bit of darker. This, the center of the chest is picking up more darker light because it's rich into there. And I think I've got that like I want it. Now getting the tricep here and just kind of sculpting down the edge on the side, just tightening, racing out that negative space to get that to work for me. Just a you know more tedious matter of time now as you dig in and kind of settle into your day's work and say, okay, do I want that reflected light there to be a little lighter coming down to the pubic area, the end of the rectus abdominis area before the pubic symphysis. So I'll lighten up that by taking a little bit of my eraser. If we were painting, it would be a, a value a little lighter, picking up reflected light. And I'll jump back to the buttocks. So, you know, I can jump back and forth, but I'm staying in the region, the pelvic, pubic, buttock region. We don't see the buttock here.
and bringing down that side of the buttock. Tighten that up a little bit, get that light working for us. And it leaves a little bit of a line. I'm okay with some of that. We're making a drawing and not a photograph. So using line and also value together to, to, to work to, to make a completed drawing and not just a photo is important. Turning the form, coming over, and around, turning through the buttock and the hamstring here, hamstring area, classic kind of egg form in the upper thigh region where the core shadow is in reflected light, and here on the, the left side here, picking, picking up a little bit of shadow where the glute ends in the... Um, the outside muscle there, the, the uh, vastus lateralis, the, the uh, iliotibial tract and through there is, or just the outer thigh. Getting a little bit of value to work for us there. It gets a little bit darker than indentations, the end of the buttock, where the leg proper ends, just in through there, just to kind of clean that up a little bit. And if I overdraw, I can take some out too as well. And I might come ac come across here and get a little bit of a darker value against that edge to make that light start to pop out further. So the light's probably where I want it. It's the background tone. I could go a little bit darker, and I could change that background if I want. If I want to stay, if I want to go darker with it or lighter with it, come back, catch your edge, use your line, catch that edge a little bit. feeling pretty, I'm getting that background where it's uh, uh, laid in. I'm pretty confident about what I've got going on in, in many parts of the figure and through here. And tweaking and working the shapes. So again, it's, it's, it might feel like it's tedious. It might certainly with the video of watching it, um, but as you draw it, hopefully it'll feel pretty fulfilling and exciting to you to, to begin to watch your drawing, begin to illuminate, and to begin to uh, evolve from the beginning parts of a gesture to uh, a more finished you know, study. Just going into the genital region, the penis and testicles here, and... and uh, Again, indicating through symbols a cylinder and an egg form, and you don't need a whole lot, you know, there unless it becomes there's a reason to just indicating what the sex of the of the um, the individual, the model is. A lot, a lot of academic studies in the past just kind of indicate it's almost like having a little underwear type thing that just grouped it all together, even though you could tell the model was nude, but for, for I guess decorum or discretion. There was a kind of a sort of a, an attempt to kind of uh, anesthetize or the region a little bit and make it a little bit more palatable for a more um, discriminating age, I suppose. And getting in that inner thigh a little bit over. Of course, we're going to change this leg as well in a little bit. All right, so I jumped ahead a little bit to uh, show you now uh, some corrections I'll start to to make and changes in, and also to work the background a little bit. So taking uh, the eraser a little bit and also blending a little bit. I'm going to do several passes at the background to, to blend a little bit and then work also into hatching value techniques and combine a little both of the, this tonal approach, which is tone and value and kind of atmosphere and also uh, as well as uh, hatching as well. So you can do several different rounds of it until you get something you really, really like. And we're setting up pretty much what's basically we're reading on the image of the uh, image that we're drawing from, which is darker on the left, 
a pi to uh, counterbalance the light on the model and then the lighter area in the lower kind of wall to counterbalance a little bit more of the, the shadow that it sits on the model as well. So we've got some some uh, work to do there to begin to um, make it more complete in, in that sense. So now I'm going to start working it all over a little bit and taking the charcoal stick and you know being mindful of edges make sure I'm bringing the value of the drawing up to the very edge of the boundary of the, the, the figure that's extremely important let's see if we can pull out a little bit here there we go it gives you a little bit better uh, uh, overall view of uh, what I'm gonna gonna work on through here and I can work it all the way to the boundary but I'll just kinda leave kind of a silhouette and I can tighten it up later with some lines to give a little bit of a concrete edge on the on the overall drawing so I'm just working the background tone being mindful of edges want to make sure I'm I'm keeping these edges crisp uh, where the end of the model is against the the background tone or atmosphere of the, of the, uh, the figure here as well also checking and defining little areas in the tricep of the model In any areas I might make adjustments, which we'll do on the shoulder and also the leg a little bit later too. Reduce the scale or the size of this other shoulder in the background a little bit, bring that down. Basically now I'm just kind of working that shape a little bit at this point in time. Since it's all in silhouette or shadow, we can work that as a shape. A little bit darker there in the shadow part, just to separate it slightly from the front arm. <clears throat> so I've got kind of a soft, extra soft charcoal pencil now to work those tones. It's really almost effortless when you start to press down. It's really soft, and and. Uh, easy to, to work with and that can be great if you, but if you're not familiar with it yet and if you go from progresso it can be super hard it's a little bit tougher to to uh, control a little bit so I like to draw my hands a little bit bigger I think they match up better with the model when they're a little larger than what you see because most of the tendency is for people to draw them too too small unfortunately <clears throat> Working that area where the tendon comes down to the olecranon area of the elbow and then the, the brachial radialis of, of the forearm as it extends out. And then getting a little bit more separation and definition between the front part of the arm, front arm against the, uh, the back arm or the, le or the right arm against the, the back left, his left. Just doing some touch-ups here, kind of rolling with what I've, as I'm narrating, kind of describing what I've what I've done, getting a little bit more definition in that form, not a whole lot, but just a little bit more in that shadow, just to give a little bit more volume. Work that tendon a little bit more as it moves down to separate those parts. We'll go back over now the background. That can be a little bit darker in value, not a whole lot. And I'm not afraid to just be loose with it. It runs into the figure. It's okay, it won't show up. It's because it's already darker. So you can be really loose and kind of overdraw into those areas. You can see how I run the, the back part of the, the, the pencil into the model a little bit. Let that fade off. I and mean, it's very much a stylistic thing. So just I'm drawing just the way I draw academically, really. And it comes out the way it looks. I 
and we'll darken that spot of light on that forearm. Just take, take it down just, just a touch. Make it reduce it a little bit. Now I'm going to change this leg a little bit so I don't want to get caught up. Hopefully I don't get caught up too much here. If not, I'll cut it out. <clears throat> but it's really the really from the knee down that I'll adjust. So I'm okay at the thigh. So notice I'll pick up different pencils to make adjustments. <clears throat> So every artist works this stage a little bit, but what's going to happen is going to be some fine tuning and tweaking all over. And you can, this is part where you can start to jump around a little bit if you want, whatever catches your eye until you refine your eye. I have a lot of students ask me, you know, what's wrong with their drawing? And then really at their advanced stages of, of their, of their uh, evolution, you know, when they really get good, really there's nothing wrong with it. I tell them the only difference is, is just fine-tuning and maybe maturity with just the subtle details that you, they might not quite have yet that separate somebody that's really seasoned and really good from somebody who is still it will almost be there and I tell them that just takes some more mileage to get um, and finish out drawings and that that will take care of itself over over time and you'll develop your own sensibilities that will be individual and unique more to you, hopefully more, more, more unique to you. So I'm just going to clean up this hand a little bit more, not a whole lot more. We'll just indicate it, just go a little bit beyond gesture to a little bit of volume and sim symbolic tone, keeping it very simple. We don't want to get so detailed here um, to take away from the focal point, which is the head and the light on the back and the shoulder that's it's still too big that I'll adjust a little bit down. Just working that shape of the hand, just being a little careful just to enhance what I have and not alter anything much. Separating the palm from the pinky uh, area. And extend those fingers out, just balancing on that, that platform. It comes up and then straightens out, which I've kind of cropped there. <clears throat> Taking a few moments to just to tighten up and through here, not a whole lot, not a whole lot left to do. <clears throat> so we'll get to this point. Hopefully I'll start to drum jump on the background here. I don't want to bore you to death here, but we we'll just tweak this hand out. There we go. So now we're back in the background here. I'll start to add more tone to that. And I could take in a charcoal stick and done this, but you want to be careful not to over overdraw the background and or do something that's going to take away from the focal point which is the figure to be careful with that it's important <clears throat> Thank you. 
So I'm careful to notice also the stroking rhythm, the movement. Um, I think it's important that you be mindful and notice these, the pattern or stroking movement or rhythm that you give your background. If you make your background straight up and down or left and right, straight uh, horizontal, it's going to deaden the movement of your sketch. And so we take great pains not to do that, to give it literally some diagonal flowy kind of movement back there unless it's really really blended and, and smooth and it wouldn't wouldn't be atmospheric it would be completely tonal but, but still we're working on a sketch I think that's important to denote is that you've got to be very mindful of how you set up the movement around a model in the atmosphere not just the model itself the movement within the model but also again the atmosphere and it kind of follows a little contours the back but it's angled right to left high right lower lower left which I think it works here and it's important you can do it in different ways but but uh, what you want to stay from is a static approach a very kind of crossed vertical and crossed horizontal I think will be will be um, detrimental to your 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 drawing very much so actually I have to be careful so now I'm going to take in kind of blend a little bit and so I take my marks my mark making up that's a paper towel I use sometimes I use a chamois sometimes I use a paper towel so I like to give a little bit more tone and then go back and and give a little bit more hatching and, and kind of repeat the process until I get something that builds up a little bit that combines both a tone and all kind of an atmosphere and also a drawing a hatched approach to, to, to very much make it a drawing. I, I do very much like like a, a hatch a hatching kind of kind of mark uh, as well. But again the, the tone is quite nice to utilize as, in addition to I think very much so. I take great pains to catch my edges. You're going to see how we build this up further that's going to create much more contrast than what we have now. We still got a ways to go working inside the negative space between the legs. We're going to alter that knee to the foot a little later. <clears throat> so I'll build this up just a little bit further. It's fairly insignificant <clears throat> to shorten the video length a little bit. Keep it keep it pretty fairly rough Also need to take some some time and great pains to keep make sure you're developing your technique to keep your hand your arm off the surface of the the drawing for good skill. You don't want to be smudging that in at, at this stage of the drawing, this type of drawing. So the hand and arm is lifted off. It's pretty loose, pretty pretty. I'm not carefree or careless, but it's pretty loose. To add that tone in, we're just going to build it up gradually, and I can go in different directions. building up that darker value along the left side that around the back it starts to illuminate notice how it illuminates the back of of the model by putting more value contrast so we're using contrast of value and then the contrast of of softer tones in the background against the harder edge of the model it makes that read and it begins to make that clear and come 
come alive and come together, which is what we want. So I've got a little charcoal stick that I picked up as well to give me a little bit more more bang for my buck, a little bit taking the the rat, the uh, paper towel in addition to the chamois. Sometimes the paper towel is better because it doesn't take as much off. Sometimes the chamois can take take off the material, which doesn't which doesn't build well for us. So now we, you notice we're building up the the value of the drawing. And getting getting it moving closer, we've got about another 25 or so minutes, 30 minutes left of the drawing. So ways to go for the background and some changes that we're going to make. Still working that negative space. So sometimes you'll go back and alter where you need to. The very you get to a very idiosyncratic stage of the drawing process where it's really really varies varies from, from artist to artist. And I mean, it all does, but this certainly it gets more idiosyncratic, meaning in, individual individual differences between, between artists. You can lighten that up a little bit and change it out if you want, if you don't like it. That's, again, the great thing about additive subtractive drawing. So I'm using that triangle there to stop the contouring, hatching against the shoulder. So it doesn't, so I'm pushing down significantly enough that I don't want it to run into the shoulder, but I want it to come up to the edge quite nicely to lighten that up a little bit. Give that a little bit of an energy in the, the background tone. So that's why I use that triangle some, and also to brace my hand against that so I can be a little bit more forceful and I can take it and smooth it down a little bit. Working that diagonal in a little bit as a design element just to kind of bring the apex and squeeze the figure a little bit. So you notice the head even further. It gives you something to play off of compositionally. So I just took what the image has and kind of tweaked it a little bit there to bring that down. Going back in and darkening that in, getting it to where I want. So I don't, you know, kind of know how the drawing is going to go, but I'm, you know, I'm still working till I want from my eye, till my eye and my mind and my hand all get into an agreement as to what I want the background to do a little bit as well. So I'll pick up the charcoal, compressed charcoal stick a little bit. It gives me a broader, slight tonal with some line to it as well. You can see that it gets more substantial there. It doesn't work on its own. It needs a little bit of manipulation with the eraser, with the chamois, or with the paper towel to get it all kind of working. 
you know, I've heard comments by artists. It's like, well, I worked, you know, two days on the figure and two weeks on the background. I was always amazed to hear some of my old, older uh, professors say that when I was a young student. I'm like, really? Wow, okay. It's like how, how amazingly complex just that design can be. So here I'm using, you notice I use the charcoal stick, just the tip of it. It's so small, the point is so sharp now, I can use it as a pencil. Be careful if it's not, it can be, it can dull out your drawing quite a bit. All right, so now I want to jump in and start making some corrections here. All right, so now we're going to make some corrections. So the first um, approach here, I'm, I'm saying I'm ready to go here for corrections. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is you notice this flow is a little bit high and that leg is a little bit um, not quite. It could be spread out a little bit. I can't completely change that. I, I want to keep the left leg, but the right leg I'm going to take out. So look at that. I'm just going to take my chamois. You don't worry about it. Make some changes that you want. I might not have even, even made any changes. It doesn't really bother me, but I think for the video's sake, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to leave that shoulder for now, but I'm going to change this uh, drawing. And oh, you just take your chamois and just take it out. Don't be scared of it. And erase sh chamois out, and you can make that adjustment. You don't want to take it all out. There's lots of good things to keep, so now we can take and... And, and work and work um, this this leg and make it a little bit uh, straighter and get a little bit better uh, feeling uh, for it. And so it's good to show you these these corrections that I'll make that I, I might not have otherwise uh, made. Sometimes when I make changes or or errors, uh, I don't even call it error if if I make it. Sometimes I'll take since I don't really like st straight up and down or horizontal. I'll always give a little bit of angle, but in this case. Um, I think it's worth changing, and so um, we'll show that. And and um, oftentimes you may not even um, change it. I think being a slave to an image without your interpretation is can be very very um, rigid. Other artists, they for whatever reason, and there can be some really compelling uh, reasons that they need to, that and they don't, they don't, they don't change it, and that could be fine. Whether it's abstraction or somewhere you know interpretation or somewhere in between so but anyway long long story short we we made the first change so we've knocked off the knee to the to the ankle we were giving we're doing surgery here and we're changing a little bit of the position widening the leg space between the two legs and then adding back on the the um the calf and the thigh pretty pretty easy easy thing to do as well and we're going to straighten this up a little bit, a little bit more. So see how relatively painless that was to do. It's not a big deal. Nothing to freak out over because we're going to make several changes to the, these longer poses that I've, I've done for the drawing database. I think each one's got some, some changes I wanted to make or corrections I needed to make. All right, so just getting the parameters now of the <clears throat> of the form, gesturing back in where I want the leg to be, calf, egg form of the calf, through here, <clears throat> calf to the, the tibia, <clears throat> and then getting the positioning back down to the the platform. We we miss about half the almost half the foot because it's of the where the eye level of of uh, the image is taken, so our eye level is about where the the uh, the top of the foot is actually. So from a distance of probably eight to ten, maybe twelve, twelve feet away, maybe a couple of meters then uh, in in metric system. So you can see again how you know relatively you know quite easy that is to adjust that out and back and correct that and change it and give a little space between the legs make it a little bit more palatable. Now I could have changed the other leg, the left leg, and straightened it up a little bit, but I, I, I really like, I wasn't bothered by really anything, but I wanted to make this change. I could change that too, and that would probably give us even more of a lean, and then I'm certainly going to change the shoulder here in a moment 
once I get this laid in here <clears throat> of the of the leg and render render that back out and look how you know relatively easy that is that's a great thing again about charcoal so it's a it's a demo a long-term pose and its corrections and and you just hopefully learn learn through you know these diagrams and it's also kind of promoting the wonderful malleability of, of charcoal and how um, as long as you keep it un, unfixed or unsealed, if you will, you can always uh, go back generally and, and change that which you've drawn upon and alter it to your, your needs or desires or whatever it is that you're doing and make corrections or, or additions to that. So uh, it's quite, um, quite wonderful that, that way. <clears throat> so just tidying up the the contour of that and getting the, the muscle that bulge to flex just a little bit putting pressure on that on that knee a little bit uh, further as well so I'm gonna I'm gonna go forward a little bit now and uh, show you the correction on the shoulder all right so you can see where I've got a flow going here but it erodes the flow a little bit of that shoulder hump too uh, too far out so I want to take some of it off it's a little bit too big so <clears throat> I can do that I'll just take the chamois I mean the uh, the stump now and see how I can just kind of erase it out and kind of carve through that and just bring it down a little bit it's popping out too much the head really should be leaning forward a little bit lower but it really doesn't it doesn't bother me so again I don't change it if I if I miss it a little bit now I can take my my drawing pencil here my my charcoal and go back and tighten up that linear line there and bring that shoulder into a little bit more uh, a better better resol less resolution there I like that a, a little much better position than I, than I had it before and um, <clears throat> you know, if I was really wanting to change, I would I would probably change the head position. But again, it, it once the image, the ph the photograph goes away, we have the drawing, and the drawing is really not out of balance. It's just a little bit different from what we have in front of you. So I'm not as rigid on that as as one might might think. If you're a sight sizer and then you're going to have problems and you'd want to change that but it's not as important to me as well so I take my chamois a little bit and I take my now uh, the paper towel a little bit here too and, and kind of soften and smooth up this background and you see the changes were relatively painless weren't they they were easy to make and really worth the time and um, if we if we if I wanted to run the video another 30 40 minutes I could change the head but I don't to render the head, and you can see where the uh, I, I left out the the final touches on the the leg that we altered from the knee to the to the foot. And you see that it uh, aligns much better. So I could still align the left leg, and I could realign the head, but it's not worth it. Make sure you, the changes that you make are worth it, and that they're relevant, and that they they help the pose out. They they really don't matter the the position of the head and the foot it's just like he would change it a little bit so I, you know if it's in within scale and proportion you're going to be okay but if it's grotesquely off then you've got problems and i would say the shoulder was way off that ridge on the deltoid uh, was too high so that would definitely had to come out too and i wanted to make an issue out of the leg as well so we're just about in ending with this sketch this longer term uh, a <clears throat> longer uh, pose of about three hours, which is about a, about a, a class uh, duration for us here at NKU. Um, <clears throat> so three hours is about one long full term pose. It's about the longest that we get for just one class session. So this is kind of where I want my students to be within about a three hour range, give or take. So they get the feeling of rendering and they get the feeling of kind of a finished you know, sketch three hours is still really, really lightning fast, but they get they can get a lot of finish and a lot of uh, experience within about this time range, and then uh, they can apply that to much, much longer, longer drawings and and, and uh, sketches too as well. So just tweaking now the background tone here. <clears throat> just a few few more minutes to to go here. <clears throat> so the name of the game is to um, you know hit your composition well with gesture and flesh it out through volume, blocking, work your core shadows and then begin to 
uh, tighten up through reflected light, edges, and balancing light, value, edges, and contrast. And then when you need to make you know, changes to your composition, you can certainly you know, do that <clears throat> as well to pull it all together. And so what are the places I could, I could correct if I wanted to keep further? I could pull the head down a little bit, maybe even pull the shoulder at a little bit more of an angle, but it doesn't bother me. And then, of course, the, the uh, left um, leg or to the leg to the left could be a little bit straighter. But those are really minor and not worth the bother anymore. So I'm just going to tweak out this, this calf here and just about conclude So, trick is to get a lot of these under your belt. Years and mileage of, of these, these sketches. And then do things on your own that are exciting for you as you work on your skill sets. So, Okay, I think we've got what we needed to get out of this. So I'm going to leave the pose at the end of the video. And I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Thumbs up. Bye-bye.